today. We're lucky to have James Dwiggins. James is the CEO of Next Home, which is a real estate brokerage franchise with over 300 locations nationwide. James brings to the table a sharp, innovative, and forward-focused vision. In 2018, James was named as a futurist by RIS Media and was just ranked 72 on this year's list of most powerful leaders in Swanepoel Power 200, which definitively ranks real estate leaders across the U.S. So if you wouldn't mind giving us a warm welcome for James Twiggins. Good morning, everyone. Oh, I need more than that. Good morning, everybody. How is everyone? Good. Thank you for having me out to Bend, Oregon. It's my first trip here. You guys have a very beautiful town. When I flew in last night, it's awfully cold. I'm from San Francisco, so not quite used to the weather that you guys have. Um, I get you guys for an hour this morning, so I have a lot to talk about on the future of real estate. I think they label me futurist because I have a lot of ideas on where I think the industry will move. Um, I definitely want to start out with the fact that I do a lot of these keynotes, and I can tell right now that all of you have a burning question, so I thought I would share a little bit about myself. First, I'm six foot seven. I know all of you are wanting to know that. No, I don't play basketball. This is what it's like to fly on an airplane when you're my height. That's actually economy plus, to be clear, and I have a complete secret. If you see me in an emergency exit, if we have a problem, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm going to open that door and I'm going to get off that plane because I am miserable when I fly like this. This is me in a taxi cab. And for some reason, photographers find it funny to chop my head off in photos. I did not crop that, by the way. So anyways, um, I appreciate being here. I'm going to share with you a lot of information today about the future of real estate. I've been in this industry my entire life. I am third generation, so my family has owned real estate companies for 62 years, both my grandparents and my parents. I was actually in real estate. I remember being born when there was a thing called the MLS book. How many of you in the room remember that? Just curious, okay. So I've seen the industry change a lot over my lifetime. 38 years old, but during that time, I've started and sold a couple tech companies inside real estate and you know, have seen the evolution of the realtor's job continue to change. Just a show of hands, who are real estate agents in the room? So I have some context to my audience, okay? So I'm gonna cover a lot today, both what things that might affect the real estate industry or realtors themselves, and then everybody in here obviously has some sort of you know, involvement in the real estate business. So we'll start with this. You know, I'm a big person and advocate on housing, and I think sometimes we don't understand how big of an impact housing is on our economy. And it's, it's, there's lots of policy decisions that occur both at the local and national level. And if you think about real estate, what happened in 2007 when, when the economy went off a cliff? Real estate prices took it down. We went through a significant recession. And ironically, real estate is one of those things that brought it back. So whatever we do, we have to think about housing and policy and what it means. It's also the single biggest driver of wealth in America is owning property. And it's something, again, to think about as we talk about a lot of these policy changes. Here's some stats I wanted to show you, and before we get into a lot of the futurist trends. So some stats from last year, the average price home was about $298,000. It was up about 3% from 2017. There's about 5.34 million existing home sales. We were down 3.1%. I'm, sure, I'm not sure in this market I heard that December was actually a fairly good month, but across the country, December was really a bad month for real estate. Um, there was a lot less home sales, and prices were continuing to come down. I do think you're going to see some of that correction over the next 24 months. So about 910,000 new home units closed. That's an estimate because we're still waiting for the numbers from December. That's up about 6%. It's no secret we're not building enough housing in this country. Over the next five years, we're expecting about 15 million new households to be developed, and we're at nowhere the proper pace in order to provide enough housing for the amount of people that need it in this country. So for builders in the room, I'm sure you're already aware of this. And then appreciation rates will be around 4.7%. If you look statistically, you can see that was the lowest appreciation rate in many years. So we're starting to see a little bit of a slowdown across different parts of the US. So one of the big questions, and when I talk about the future of real estate, I'm going to hit it from a, a whole bunch of angles. Um, and one of them is, what is the future of the realtor? 
Now, in fairness, I have about 3,000 agents in my company, so I am an advocate for what we do, and I want to make sure that we have longevity in the business. But it's no secret that this is a question consumers are asking today, and I think it's a big one. Are they going to be working with a realtor in 10 years, or is technology, artificial intelligence, and other things going to replace them? My answer is, I think that you're going to see a combination of both. But if you ask a buyer or seller today what a realtor does and what they did for the commission they charged, you're not going to get a very specific answer. They don't actually know. And this is something I think as an industry we have to continue to look at. And let's be honest, the real estate experience itself kind of sucks. And I'm being polite in a certain way here when I say this that if you have a transaction, for instance, in San Francisco, where I'm from, the disclosure package on a condominium is about 256 pages. Okay, so the transaction is getting more complex. There's a lot of paperwork in the process. But the consumer really doesn't actually understand what goes on because in some cases we're very good at sheltering them from it. And in many cases, there's also too many realtors in the business. There's 1.4 million realtors in the United States, over 2 million licensees but there's about 5.4 million annual home sales, you can do the math, there's too many people in the business and there's too many inexperienced people in the business. Lack of broker oversight is another one. How many of you heard of Redfin? Okay. So here's a company that's changing the way that real estate is bought and sold and how they um, oversee their agents through employees. There's lots of changes coming to the market. And this is a big one here, if you look at this stat, 82% of sellers said they would use their real estate agent again, yet 23% actually do. That's a really bad stat. That means that we're not doing a good enough job of staying in touch with our clients. And then the big one that I got from Zillow, right now, buyers and sellers, 50% of the time are not being responded to on inquiries from consumers. So the big question is this. Real estate agents need to clearly provide and articulate a better value proposition or they're going to be removed from the buying and selling process. And I think this is something that we have to think about. So one of the big things that's coming into the market is venture capitalists. And if you look at the numbers, this is a fascinating stat. In 2010, it was about $33 million being invested into real estate tech, yet in 2017, over $5 billion was put into it. $5 billion. That is a massive amount of money being thrown into the real estate business to change the way it works. And there's a lot of companies that are coming for it, and here is a big reason why. So many of you probably aren't aware of this, but this is the commission amount that realtors make on an annualized basis in the United States. It's about $62 billion with an average commission of around 5%, two and a half per side. If you look at the way other countries sell real estate, for example, in Australia, the annual commission pool is about 4.7 billion with an average commission of 2%. In Australia, the way property is sold is through auction. So literally, the realtor does the whole talking fast thing. Everybody comes out to the front lawn as a buyer, and they go through an auction process, the home is purchased right then and there. There's actual no buyer representation either. That's how a majority of properties are sold in other countries. If you look at this statistic though, $62 billion is a lot of money. Why would Silicon Valley not want to get into it and grab a piece of that? So one of the things that's happening now is called iBuyers. Are you familiar with these companies? Have you heard of them before? Okay. If you haven't, and this affects everybody, you're going to see more of this. So iBuyers are a new trend, open door being the most popular one in the market, and they have massive amounts of funding. And what they're doing is, they're basically saying, out of convenience, put your property address into the website, we'll have it go through our algorithm, we'll come up with a valuation, and we'll purchase it, close in seven days, all cash, hand the keys over, open door turns around, rehabs the property, and then throws it back on the market. You take a slight discount, somewhere between 7 to 10 percent, but essentially you get the convenience of not having it sit on the market for a long period of time. Now we've seen these companies before, obviously as markets get fast, these companies pop in and then a lot of them go away over time, but the difference is these companies have 1.5 billion dollars to play with. They have the resources to 
have an impact on the market. Knock is a company that's come in where they will purchase the property for a buyer before they actually purchase their home. So they, they do it simultaneously. There's a new company I just found out about called Unison. This is a really interesting approach where if a buyer only has 5% down, they'll come up with the other 10% or 15% and they'll invest in the property. So essentially they give the additional down payment and when the property sells, they benefit from the appreciation. So they take their money back out when the home sells in the future. There's lots of models coming into the industry to grab a piece of that transaction. And here's some really interesting stats. A lot of people think that these companies will come and go. I disagree. And the reason I disagree is I think there's an element of convenience that sellers will look for, circumstances in their life, um, divorce, things like that where people need to move and they could have a significant impact on the market. Now here's some stats that will really blow your mind. In Phoenix alone, 5% of the market share has already gone to iBuyers. Offerpad, Open Door, et cetera. In Dallas, 10% of the listing inventory is owned by iBuyers. Now, that's a significant shift in the way that we buy and sell real estate based upon these business models. And Open Door is now in 16 markets and continuing to expand. So what does the future look like? Well, this is what they do to advertise to the consumer. Selling your home the traditional way can be a long process. You have to set the price, second guess the price, prep the house, paint the house, recarpet the house, declutter the house. It's really cluttered. Decat smell the house, fix this, replace that, toss these, get rid of those, list the house, pick up the toys, bake some cookies, have an open house. Let strangers rummage through your closets. Wait for an offer. Freak out that you overpriced it. Have another open house. Get interrupted during dinner. Hello. Leave for a showing. Get an offer. Lose the offer. Get another offer. Haggle. Accept the offer. Have inspections. Fix more stuff. Go into escrow. Hope they don't bail on the offer. Close a month later. And then realize you could have had the same offer from Open Door months ago. So sell your house to Open Door and skip all the stress and uncertainty. Get your free offer in 48 hours at opendoor.com. Okay, so pushing on the bruise, right? If you think about a slower real estate market, which we'll be heading into, you know, DOM goes up, properties on the market for months, you get multiple offers or actually less offers, and so they're looking at it from a convenience standpoint. But some of the things that Open Door is doing, so I'm going to start talking about the way the future looks like now. Some of the stuff that Open Door is doing, I think, is really fascinating. So when they take a property over, they change out the, the locks on the doors to be this computer-coded lock. And as a buyer, you can go to Open Door's website and go, I want to look at this property. You register with your information. It sends you a one-time code to your phone, which you're seeing right here. You go to the property, you type in the code, the door opens, and you can tour the home without an agent there. And that's, I think, one of the things that Open Door is looking at is how do they grab more of the market share by removing somebody from the process. So you're seeing some of the technology advancements and how they're pushing convenience. And I, and, and I also want you to think about experience. So what I'm going to talk about a lot next is the way consumer trends are moving when it comes to experience. And if you think about it from a buyer's perspective, this is really convenient. I don't have to arrange a showing time. I don't have to deal with you know, times of getting the seller out of the house. I can just go to the property, tour it on my own terms, close the door, the code's done, and I move on. So this is an interesting way that they're using technology and convenience. What I, what I like about these companies and why I think that they're good for our industry is they're pushing the envelope of what we need to do to create that better experience for buyers and sellers. So let's talk about consumer habits so you have some context to this. We have become the most impatient society on planet Earth, right? I mean, we are, let's be honest, right? We want everything right now. And depending upon the generation you're talking about, whether it's Gen Xers, Millennials, or Gen Z coming into the market, they're wanting information very quickly and they want it on their terms. Amazon understands this, which is why they've launched Amazon Prime now. So in San Francisco, I can order things on Amazon and it can be delivered to my front door in two hours. Convenience factor. Other companies continue to adopt this same 
thought process. So for example, Plated or you guys have Blue Apron or any of these other companies, they understand that it takes two household incomes to make a living anymore and it's very difficult at the end of the day to worry about groceries and everything else you have to do. So you can go to these companies, set your entire week's schedule of food, and it shows up in a box every day with instructions on what to cook, how to do it, and you're done in 30 minutes. Convenience. Trunk Club. This is now owned by Nordstrom's. So they realized early on that men are really, we're not very good at shopping, and we don't like it. So they said, what if we created a way where you could join this club, and we'll figure out your sizing, and we'll send you stuff every month that we think would be good, Keep the stuff that you like, put the stuff you don't want back in the box, and it sends it back, shipping's included. And that was a way for them to get more product out in the marketplace. This was purchased by Nordstrom's, so now it's a product that they offer because they're understanding that retail is changing at a significant pace. And you probably have seen this even in your own town, commercial space, you know, companies going online, companies doing more virtual-based uh, products. And what this caused was a 31% increase in bankruptcies in retail in 2017. And it continued in 2018. You guys know a lot of these brands. Sears being the latest one that filed for bankruptcy. Retail space is going to go through massive change. I go to a lot of cities across the United States especially smaller cities where we used to have malls, and they're empty. There's nobody in them anymore, right? This is an area of real estate that is a real concern for the future, is all this commercial space and how companies are going to either use it or not. And there's a lot of debt tied up into the commercial real estate space as well. But companies continue to move based upon this. So two stats I want to show you that I think are absolutely critical in the way that you think about your business in the future. So you have to prioritize experiences and then convenience, two specific things. And I'm going to give you an exact example on how this move is shifting. So the first is 78% of millennials would rather pay for an experience than material goods. Let me give you an example of this. So in San Francisco, our real estate prices are absolutely outrageous. If you wanted a two-bedroom, two-bath apartment in the city, it's going to cost you six to $7,000 a month. So what ends up happening is people look at that and they go, well, I'm going to look at that as just a place to sleep. So younger people will get a two-bedroom, two-bath apartment, but they have four people living there. To them, the experience of living in the city is what they're looking for. Their neighborhood restaurant becomes the place they hang out or bars, et cetera. So they look at real estate slightly different than, for instance, my generation would. And the other thing, which is an also important part, is 57% say they'll switch brands if a company doesn't provide an easy checkout process. You've seen this occur around your own town, and it's happening before your eyes. You're probably just not aware of it. Let me give you an example. How many of you guys have been to JCPenney or Nordstrom's or any of these stores? Show of hands, I'm assuming everybody has, right? So think about the experience when you walk into one of these stores. Well, I'll give you mine. I walk into this, I freak out because I don't know where to go. There's so much stuff here. Somebody comes up to me and they say, can I help you? And of course, my initial response is, no, I'm good, right? I got this. I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do. So we walk around the store. You pick out all this stuff. You go to the room to try on clothes, which for me, none fit. And then once you go through that process, you then leave all that stuff there, and you get the stuff you want, you just want to get out of there, and then what happens? We go to the checkout process, and there's a bunch of people there, and I'm going to have to wait 10 minutes, and you go through this whole thing, and it's just a nightmare. And this is what we're thinking about. We just subconsciously are doing it. Who changed that? Can anybody think of the company that changed both the experience and the checkout process? I'll give you a hint. It's a company that's worth more than any company in the world. Apple at first. Yeah. How many of you been to an Apple store? Okay. So when you go into an Apple store, and I'm not going to deny the fact there's still some issues with Apple stores, but you go to the front and they say, what can I help you with? And you say, I'd like to have a case. Perfect. That's over here to the left. Go over there, look at the cases, and then we'll send somebody over. You go look at the cases, you figure out what you want, the person comes over and you say, I'd like to have the blue case, they say, perfect, they call somebody, they come bring it up to them. What is the checkout process in an Apple store? Anybody remember? 
They bring the case over. The person that came over to help you has a little phone with a little checkout thing. They give you the product. They swipe your credit card. It emails it to you automatically, and you walk out the door, right? The other thing to notice about this, look at the size of the retail space versus what Apple's doing. There's no inventory, it's in the back. So they're keeping the retail space a lot smaller. They're realizing the way the consumer wants to shop. This is one of the most fascinating studies going on right now in retail. And it's by Nordstrom, of course. This is in Southern California. This is what we think and what most people think the future of retail will look like. So this Nordstrom store is only 3,000 square feet. It's very small, there's no inventory. And what they're doing is they're changing the way that you buy clothes and products at their store. So the merchandise on display, but it's not for sale. So they have all the sizes. There's just not, you know, 30 of them. You can have alterations and tailoring done on site. Grab a coffee or juice at the bar. That's included. And the most important part is order the things that you want. And when it shows up, they'll text you. And you come to curbside. Somebody comes out, hands you the package in your car, and you move on. So for people in commercial real estate, this is a nightmare because 100,000 square foot box stores are a thing of the past with the way that Nordstrom's is approaching it. So I think you're looking at some sort of combination of the future. And even Amazon knows this too. So Amazon is obviously the biggest retailer in the world, but who did they purchase two years ago that happens to have physical locations? Anybody name them? Whole Foods, right. And Amazon allows you to drop your packages off and pick them up at their Whole Foods locations. They're looking at ways to get physical footprint in local communities. So there's somewhere in the middle of all of this is the way the future of retail will look. So with that, let's talk about some tech, um, which is dear to my heart. So this is one of the most interesting studies I've ever seen and most interesting products I've ever seen produced. Um, has anybody ever heard of this? Just curious, anybody in the room? No, okay, good, you guys are gonna love this. So this is called the next Rembrandt. It was a project done by ING and Microsoft. And you're about to have your minds blown here. So this was a product that they said, we wanna have a computer analyze and learn and study every Rembrandt painting that's ever been painted. And we're gonna allow the computer to do that analysis. We're gonna hook it up to a 3D printer and we're gonna let the computer determine what it thinks the next Rembrandt painting should look like. So just so everybody understands this, this is not engineers coding it, telling it what to paint. They gave the computer a set of parameters, it did the analysis, and it decided how it wanted to paint the next Rembrandt. So what it determined was the next painting would be a portrait, Caucasian male with facial hair, 30 to 40 years old, dark clothing, with a collar, wearing a hat, facing to the right, right? And this is what it painted. So for context, you have to think about this. This machine did this analysis and it painted something that probably none of us in this room could ever do, right? This is artificial intelligence. This is how machines are learning. I'm showing you this because there's some really fascinating applications that this can apply towards real estate. So let me give you an example. Imagine if we took the same algorithm that was created by Microsoft and ING and we applied it to the home buying process where inside the multiple listing service, right, all the photos of all these homes, what if that program were to study your shopping habits and the way that you're favoriting homes or homes that you like and it's studying that, and it's also simultaneously looking at every single home inside the MLS database. And it's looking at all the photos of those properties. And through that same algorithm, it's determining that here are four homes that are very similar to the one that you seem to be liking, the style of home. And it's starting to send the buyer properties that best fit what they're looking for. Would that change the experience in a positive way? Yeah. And that's some of the stuff that's actually happening. There's a company called Real Scout that's doing this today, where they're using machine learning, the ability for it to study photos to determine a better buyer result. Where it gets scary is this, or the next one I'm gonna show you. So this is a very famous game called Go, it's a Chinese game, and Google 
decided that it wanted to see if it could create an artificial intelligence engine that would play the number one player in the world. So this is Lee. He's the best. Nobody's ever beaten him. In the first game, Lee beat the computer. Every subsequent game after, the computer has beaten Lee. Anybody know why that is occurring? Yeah, it's learning. It's studying his patterns. It's studying the way that he plays the game, and it figured out how he's going to play the game because a computer can process information faster than the brain, and it's multiple steps ahead, and now the computer is able to beat the number one human being in the world. A little scary. Or this. It's one small step for Sophia, one giant leap for robot kind. This is Sophia the robot taking her first steps. She's even got some sweet dance moves up her sleeve. Her skin, called frubber, helps her look lifelike and have human expressions. She can blink, turn her head and smile, but she has over 60 different facial expressions. Now she's even more human-like thanks to legs from DRC Hubo. That's the same body that won the DARPA Robotics Challenge in 2015. Her legs allow her to walk, potentially run and climb stairs like the DARPA Robotics Challenge Huba. She can uh, then move through a human-like environment, use human-like tools. These legs have a maximum speed of 30 centimeters per second, which is around 0.6 miles an hour. It doesn't seem particularly fast now, but her creators told me that one day they hope she'll play soccer. Now she has a body, Hanson Robotics says she has applications in medical therapy, factory co-work situations, and research. It's going to take many years for the machines to be truly alive. So, Sophia has opinions on many different topics, including Star Wars and cryptocurrency, but her responses are partially scripted and partially AI. So, conversation can be a little bit stilted. Tell me what it was like to take your first steps. I'm really excited, a little disoriented, but really excited. All right, who's scared? <laughs> right. By the way, she's not actually the robot. David, the doctor there, was actually the robot, the guy talking. Um, so, you know, does this have applications in real estate? Maybe to some degree. I think what I'm showing you this for is to show you where artificial intelligence is moving. And there's lots of potential applications for it. I think maybe long term, you're going to see more involvement with AI inside the house. I'll talk about Amazon and what they're doing in a few minutes to give you some context to it. But there's certainly a lot of great applications for AI, though, that you guys are using on a daily basis. You probably just don't even realize it. So for instance, your Google mapping or when you guys use Uber, that's using artificial intelligence. So it's using your location-based services on your phone. And it's actually studying how fast you drive between traffic lights. It's taking all of that information up into the, into the computer. It's analyzing that traffic pattern, and it's giving you real-time stats on how long it will take you to get to your next destination. It takes, for example, when an accident happens, that accident goes up into the same database, and it'll reroute you because it knows that information. So AI can be a very good thing when it's used properly. And again, you're using it on a daily basis. This is a company I'm interested in. Um, they just got about $21 million in funding. And I find this one interesting because I do a lot of travel and I'm on airplanes and hotels and all of this stuff. And for how many of you guys have been to Expedia and tried to figure out the best way to do a trip? Like it's, it's not the most convenient thing on the planet, right? So this company is using artificial intelligence to study the way that you travel. For example, if you like to sit in an aisle seat on a plane or if you like to be in the exit row like me at the window, it looks at all of these different things that you like, where you stay at hotels, king size bed, and it uses AI to study all the different hotels, the different airlines, and give you the best recommended travel pattern based upon your own personal traits. And I think this is an interesting way for a system to determine how travel, the travel experience can be better for you without you having to do a lot of that work. So watch for this company, they're out of Canada. Um, another thing that's gonna affect real estate, and I think this will have massive effects on the way city development works, is autonomous um, vehicles. And, you know, for a long time, there's been debate about what the future of that looks like. You know, if you look at the way that it, these companies are putting money into electric vehicles, it, they're, they're, they're doubling down on the fact it's the future. Um, Porsche just came out with their new electric vehicle that's, that's, that's going to be out in this next year. And 
they're doing double the production than they originally anticipated because they feel the market's going to pick up on that. But why I'm telling you this is this actual piece, autonomous vehicles, I think will have the single biggest change on the American economy over the next 10 to 20 years. And if you think about what that impact can be, in many cases, I'll talk just real estate specific, but the value of transit hubs. So as most of you know, in major cities, outside the city, for instance, mass transit has locations and there's a lot of development that goes on around those mass transit locations because it's an easy way to get in and out of the city. Well, if you have an electric vehicle, autonomous vehicle, that doesn't require you to drive, where you can work while you're in the car, distance becomes less of an issue, right? You're not having to pay attention to what's happening in front of you. So you might see trends where people move further outside the city because a two-hour commute isn't as big of a deal because you can work in the vehicle at the same time. Or another one, uh, suburban or city living, but the need for parking. Right now, this is an interesting study that's happening where if you go to major cities like Portland or Seattle or San Francisco, parking spaces and parking is obviously, there's not a lot of it. But if you have an autonomous vehicle, you no longer need to worry about where to park a car. So all of those spaces can eventually become developments for housing, um, and it will change the way cities look at their development process. Where it gets really scary is job loss. So autonomous vehicles will, will basically change trucking forever. And Tesla's already working on that. They're coming out with their new, their new Tesla truck. But if, if you don't have to have a human being behind driving a vehicle anymore or 10 hours before they have to take a break, distance becomes less of an issue, products get moved faster, and unfortunately you'll see massive change in jobs. So there's positives and negatives to the way that this shift might occur in the future. I think this is a massive thing to look at for the way that housing prices are affected in cities if people can live further out and it's not as big of an issue. So Amazon. Rumors have been swirling for a long time about Amazon coming into real estate. It's no secret that they're already trying to get inside of the house through smart technology like Alexa. Um, and so if you look at what they're doing, they have a partnership with Lennar. They're talking to a lot of other builders to create smart homes where their voice initiated smart homes. And I absolutely will tell you this is the future of the way home builder development will go. Your house being able to, you can talk to it, tell it to turn on the music, turn on the AC, order services, they will be interactive with you. And Amazon is doubling down on this right now. They just acquired a company that's working very heavily on how to build Alexa into the home itself. The other thing that the rumor mill is happening is that Amazon will eventually get into the real estate business itself. I don't have any confirmed knowledge on this, but some of the topics that I've heard are that they'll become a, a real estate brokerage where you can buy houses on their website. They won't charge you a commission to do it, but they'll make their money on mortgage, title, and some of the other services. It would be a big change to our industry if Amazon did that. I'm not convinced that somebody wants to buy their house through Amazon.com, but we can certainly see how that works towards the future. So housing, let's talk a little bit about this. So I think that one of the biggest things I mentioned earlier on about housing and our GDP is that we need more of it, and I think we need to get more creative about how we do it. So there's a lot of companies doing some really innovative things out there, um, and I'm going to show you a few of them through container homes. Um, less expensive to build. There are 17 million containers in existence in the United States and there's $2,500 average price. So if housing's a problem, which I think we can all agree with, we need to make it more affordable people to get into that process. Here is a great example. Obviously, the one on the right is more luxury, and the one on the left is more simplistic. Here's some other examples of housing that is less expensive. We have to get more creative about how we do housing in this country. And we need to make it so that it's affordable for people, so that every, every income demographic has an ability to be part of the American dream. And that's what it's about. So this is also a really interesting thing that, um, that I found. I think you'll find this um, development to be fascinating. Over 1,000 square feet of functionality and only 420 square feet. One generously sized room that does it all. Productive home office with sit down or stand up desk.
comfortably seat 10 for dinner. A big couch and a big projector. Sleeps two guests comfortably. So as you can see, it's a very innovative way to approaching development in major cities. Places like San Francisco, like I said, Seattle, Portland, New York, I mean, this is, this is something that will get very innovative and bring prices of, of homes and the ability to get into homeownership down. So financial impacts, talk a little bit about this as well. There are some major concerns that I see in the future of real estate as well. And unfortunately, homeownership is down across all age demographics because it's just too expensive to get into it. Um, and these are some of the stats that I think are important to look at. So, you know, under 35 years of age, it's down 8%. Uh, 35 to 44, it's down 10. 45 to 54, it's down 8%, et cetera. Homeownership rates are declining in this country. They're not increasing. And again, it has to do with supply and demand economics. So local cities, state, federal, have to think about housing policy in ways that we can make it more affordable so people can jump into it because, as I mentioned earlier on, it's 13 to 15% of our GDP. Another thing to talk about, and I'll talk about this delicately, is our mounting U.S. debt um, and certainly our new tax laws. This country has massive amounts of debt that, unfortunately, our government doesn't seem to want to address. And even the new tax laws are estimated at about $1.9 to that debt itself. And there's changes that have occurred. I think you're probably all aware of this, but the mortgage interest deduction was certainly changed. $1 million down to seven fifty. dollars Property tax, uh, tax deduction capped at $10,000. And even your moving expenses can't be deducted anymore. My concern always is that if we have policy at either local or federal level that affects housing, it can have an impact on the economy itself. The other thing to think about is, at least in California, um, school funding comes from property taxes. And if prices come down, then revenue comes down for our education, which in our state is already stressed to its limits anyway. So it's just so many things that housing is connected to. So let's talk about evolution of industries real quick. I'll give you guys some context to what happens if we don't constantly think about change. So we'll play a little game here. What happened to this company? The one store in, I think, Bend, isn't it, up here? Right? Yeah. Right. It's making a big comeback in your city only. Um, I, that's actually ironic. I didn't think about that, that I'm actually in the city where there's actually Blockbuster. So the Twitter account is managed by that one location. So, um, But if you look at the study of this, it's, it's really quite fascinating how fast a company can lose its throne. And it didn't take long for Blockbuster to go bankrupt. And it was a really simple model. So who changed it? Yeah. You have to think about Netflix before what you think about them today as streaming. The reason Blockbuster made all of its money was off of what? I'm willing to bet half of you in this room have found a Blockbuster video in your attic or your basement at some point in the past 10 years, right? They made most of their money off of late fees. That's literally how Blockbuster made most of its money. So if you think about when Netflix first came out, it was really simple. Well, we're just going to create a website, order the movie, we'll send you the DVD, and when you send it back to us, we'll send you the next one. Get rid of late fees, destroy Blockbuster's business model, and within 36 months, it went bankrupt. That quick. What about this one? Yeah, who? Exactly. Borders Books, Amazon. And it was the invention of the Kindle, right? The ability to have digital books. You can download new books at your house. You don't have to get out of the bookstore. Retail space creates higher expenses for it. And it's just showing you how tech can move industries very quickly. Um, this is my, my favorite example of what I would call really bad leadership. I'm not shy about the fact I think the CEO of this company is an idiot. Um, and I say that because he literally lives on an island, and he doesn't go in to meet with his senior team, and he does all of his meetings via uh, video teleconferencing. And this company has been on a downward trend for a long time, and then they sold off Craftsman and all their major products, and obviously they filed for bankruptcy, and this company's done. Um, it happens quickly if you're not paying attention to how 
industries move. And Walmart was really the driver of this. We think Amazon, but it wasn't. It was the big box stores like Walmart where they drove down prices, put everything in one location. Americans are cheap, we all are. And so what ended up happening is Sears wasn't able to keep up with these changes. And within a short period of time, Sears is obviously now gone. And they were one of the biggest in the country. So massive change occurs. I love this example for a very specific reason. And this is an industry that was really powerful. And then there was one company that came out and changed it all. Anybody remember who this was that took down travel agents? Expedia. Yeah. And... Expedia was actually started by a guy named Rich Barden, and he used to work for Bill Gates, and they created this fund to get into the travel industry that said, we're going to go in and try to disintermediate the industry. We don't need the middleman anymore in this process. Let's bring the airlines directly to the consumer, bring those savings down through the website, and all of a sudden you started to see this online change occur where travel agents weren't part of the process. Then they bought Hotwire, which was their competitor, for $650 million. Talk about a conglomerate. And Expedia now owns the travel industry. Now, why I'm showing you this is really fascinating. Because what's the industry making the biggest comeback right now in the United States? It's the one on the left. Travel agents are making a huge comeback right now. I actually use one. And the reason is simple. For $35, I can pay a travel agent to take care of all my hotel, all my airline stuff. She's hooked into the reservation system. So she'll send me all the airlines and all their rates. And if I have a flight get canceled, who's had that happen to them before? Right. It's the most miserable experience possible if you have to get Expedia on the phone because you can't. And secondly, you sit in line at the desk for an hour with everybody else trying to figure out what flight to get on. See, with a travel agent, I don't have to do that. I call her, she's hooked into the system and automatically rebooks me while everybody else is in line for $35. So that convenience, I'm kind of going back to the comment earlier, convenience and experience is worth the extra money versus having to go through the hassle of what Expedia offers. So just think about, again, the way that the consumer wants to receive information. So what's next? I think that you're going to see quite a few trends occur. I think housing is going to be addressed um, more rapidly. I think local cities are going to have to make changes in the way that they do development. Um, I think autonomous vehicles are going to rapidly shift our industry, and we're going to have to deal with how that works. Just think about, this is one topic I brought up, just think about if, if all of a sudden we're using electric vehicles and we're doing autonomous driving, what happens to gas stations? and all the food industry that's touching gas stations and all the jobs that are associated with that, right? These things will have massive impacts on our economy. And so a lot of this stuff has to occur over time. Some of the things I see, I think you'll see iBuyers, these companies that are buying and selling real estate, I estimate they'll be as much as 30% of the market. I know that sounds grim, but I believe that will happen. There's a reason. I think convenience is going to get looked at more seriously than just price appreciation or the value. And statistically speaking, if you look at the way millennials view money, they don't care about money as much as the older generation does. For them, it's, you know, if I have to lose 5% of my value but I can just move on with my life, they'll do that. And so that's a big question on do I want to spend three months selling my property or can I just exit now? The other big trend I think you'll see when it comes to that subject is these iBuyers are going to have a lot of competition. So, for example, most major brokerages in the United States are going to get into the business. Keller Williams is currently looking at it. Realogy, who owns Cobalt Bankers, Century 21, ERA, Sotheby's, all these brands are under one company. They're going to get into the iBuyer business. I'm looking at it. And what will happen is if we have 18 investment companies that are all vying for this opportunity, I think a lot of these other firms like Open Door are going to have a lot of price pressure. It'll bring that down, and that market share from 30 might drop eventually long term. But the idea of you buying or, having, or selling your house to a company and buying your house from a company is going to be more prevalent. Who's the single largest, um, who's, the, who's the company that owns more real estate assets and rentals in the United States? Anybody name them? Yeah, Blackstone. Over the past 10 years, they bought like 96,000 properties across the U.S. that they rent. 
So one company is one of the single biggest renters in the United States for single family residences. So companies are figuring out how to be involved in that, in that process. So I, I, I will tell you that I think the future is also very bright. You know, home ownership is still the driver of our economy. It's the single biggest asset Americans own. It's the single biggest way to drive wealth. How we buy and sell is going to change, and how local economies are going to adjust to it is also one of those things we have to pay attention to. I know that just talking to cab drivers, you guys are dealing with traffic and lots of changes in your city. In San Francisco, we have our issues as well. Every city does, but it, ironically, it all fundamentally works around real estate. But at the end of the day, everybody involved in this will help move that future forward. And with that, thank you very much for having me today. I believe we have a few Q&A. Thank you, James. My mic. So now's the time that we're going to take questions for James because he does have to catch a plane and he's not able to join us later on the panel. So if anybody has questions for James, if you can come to either side of the room, we're going to have mics for you to ask the question. Please do not make them related to my height. <laughs> Any questions? I think Robin's on this side of the room, so we can start with Robin. Do I have a mic for this side? Okay. Katie has the mic. <laughs> no questions. I, you know, I'm not sure. Oh, Katie has the mic for you. I do. Okay, awesome. Catch. Come right up here. Yeah. Sorry about this, folks. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is, what do you foresee with the current retail spaces, for example, Sears, across the nation, they're going bankrupt. So those malls that we see empty, um, do you see those being rezoned into residential, or do you see Amazon buying them out, or Combination storing of both. our autonomous vehicles? Combination of both, yeah. I, I think it, it, right now, so I was talking to an economist, you know, some of the the massive amount of debt right now is, is actually in retail. Um, and you know the, the lending from banks is there. I, I think you're gonna see some pretty big shifts because who's gonna take it over? Like what, why, what's the point of creating this inventory when we do most of our shopping online? You know, If you look at stats, for example, like Netflix, 35% of its revenue comes from recommendations. So you, know, you look at something on Netflix and then it tells you all these other things to watch and you end up watching that. That's how they get 35% of revenue. With Amazon, it's almost double that. So all the stuff you don't need to buy after you looked at something on Amazon, right, that they recommend to you, that you end up purchasing, that's where you get a lot of it. So the point I'm making with the convenience factor, I think retail is in deep trouble. I do. And I do think it'll be rezoned and we should. Um, parking autonomous vehicles outside of city limits is certainly one of those options that's being looked at. Uh, personally speaking, I would not be invested in retail right now, just based upon a lot of the trends that I'm looking at, for sure. Yeah. We have another question over here. You talked a lot about the convenience of the iBuyers on the impact of real estate agents, and it sounds really grim. One thing that I, I don't think you addressed, and I'd love to hear your opinion on, is the value add that buyers agent specialists could still have in this, in this market. Um, I think that the convenience sounds really appealing to me as a buyer, but I still worry about Zillow and Redfin not really having my back as a buyer and that, that space that still seems to exist uh, from that frame of uh, reference. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, let me be very clear. I think that there is an enormous need for real estate agents in the process in the future, um, now and in the future. And I don't see iBuyers removing that. Um, the problem I see with our business currently is that there's too many realtors in it and too many inexperienced realtors in the process. And what happens is the consumer, so you could go to any brand, name any real estate company, and you have 100 agents in it, but we all know 20 of them are doing most of the business that's in that office. And so the consumer is getting charged the same commission, essentially, for services that can be really mediocre if somebody's brand new to some degree. They just don't have the experience level to somebody who's been in the business a long time. Um, I do believe that over the course of time, real estate companies and agents will do a better job of helping the buyer in this particular, this particular example see the value of what they do. And I also think that showing them, as I mentioned, kind of price, pr price pressure comes down on iBuyers, that they're going to make 7 to 10% more in the market. If we can figure out a way to show the buyer more value in that and then create that disconnect or, or a little more separation between their price, I think realtors have 
a, a, a significant value in the future. Candidly, I don't see more than 600,000 realtors in the United States in 10 years. I just don't. There's just, there's just not enough home sales going on, right? I mean, the, the, if you look statistically the past 10 years, we're selling between 5 to 5.5 million units annually. That number has been consistent, but the number of realtors the past 5 to 10 years has continued to go up, right? So I think that it's, we need to do a better job, and, you know, we'll, we'll figure out where, that, where we fit into that future, right? We yeah. have a question over here, James. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. I'm wondering what, based on everything that you've said um, with your firm, with Next Home, what are you doing or what types of technologies are you adopting as a company or strategies that you're taking as a company to um, best prepare for what lies ahead? Um, that's a great question. So. We are approaching it very differently than I think most are currently. The way, so the way I look at it as far as, I'll just speak for our company specifically on this. Right now, the way that people look at buying or selling is the agent's involved in this small window of time. Like I, I inquire about a property, the agent helped me purchase it, and if you go back to that stat I showed you, 82% of the clients said they would work with the agent again, but only 22% do. We don't, as an industry, we don't have anything to offer a value after the transaction closes. Right? I, I don't need to be told when I need to change my clock back because my phone does it automatically. Um, I don't need the Giants baseball schedules. I can get that online. Like my, my, and I don't need recipe cards because I've got plated to send me stuff. Right. So the point I'm making is we have to find a way to have more value. We're, we're specifically just looking at massive amounts of data. So we're aggregating data on the transaction. We're aggregating data, consumer information about all of you. We're looking at when, you know, Somebody, uh, kids turns 18 and they're going off to Stanford. We're looking at all these data points to create a different experience where the agent is the focal point of the conversation of home ownership for seven to 10 years, the time frame in which they own that property. So, you know, it's the agent's gonna call the person when the roof warranty is about to expire or when the refrigerator inside the home is on recall. Instead of GE telling you that, our agents are going to tell the, the client that. So for us, we're looking at how we shift that value proposition from being a small window to a long period of time. That's where our major focus is. So. Can I just ask a quick follow-up to that? Sure. So um, are there any of the $5 billion that's going into prop tech right now, is there anything that stands out to you that, um, you know, that, the, that the brokers or the agents can be using as opposed to sort of the, the technology that's competing with brokers and agents? I think in time, there's nothing that stands out right away for sort of what I'm talking about, but I think you're going to see a lot of that development come out over the next few years. Like, Keller Williams is doing a lot with something called Kelly. It's an artificial intelligence engine. It's just the name for it. Um, there's a company called Compass, which is the new player on the block. They've had $800 million in venture funding. Um, they're developing their own proprietary CRM. Realogy is doing the same thing. So I, I think you'll see a lot of this movement from brokerages today the industry is just starting to react to it. Our industry is too slow. Like, we're just not moving quickly enough. You know, I look at it like, why do we as an industry not have those keypads on doors to make it easy for a buyer to come in? You know, it's, it's again, thinking from a consumer perspective. So the answer is no, but I think in the next 24 months, you'll see a lot of really interesting tech come out. Yeah. All right, question from this side. So being in the mortgage industry, yep. I probably should start an online mortgage company or look for another career? <laughs> no, not at all. I, and I don't mean to sound, you know, grim on that, but there's, I mean, let's face it, you know, Quicken Loans has obviously got massive market share, and they were obviously in the refi side of it, and now they're moving aggressively into the purchase side. Rocket Mortgage isn't actually anything automated. It's people actually pushing papers behind the, this thing. I've actually seen it. Um, but it's a great consumer play. So, no, I think that, I think that here, here's the way that it's being looked at. If Amazon were to come into the business, and hypothetically, I'm not sure this is true, but if they were offering the real estate transaction without you know, being charged a commission, and they're going to make money on the mortgage side of it, well, and they can sell a lot of their other products and services, there may be downward pressure on you know, what you can make in that side of the business. And I think everyone's looking at that. So you know, again, but at the end of the day, the other gentleman, what we provide from an experience and value like the services, people are willing to pay a premium if they see a value in what you provide. That's a perfect example. Like you could buy a Honda Civic, which is arguably a better car long-term than a Mercedes, 
but people at a certain income level buy Mercedes because they find value in that experience. So there's always a place for us in it. It's just a matter of making sure you clearly articulate what that might be. And I don't see mortgage going away like that. Um, I think there will be pressure on the amount of people in it, but we've also already had that happen over the past 10 years. So, yeah. We have two more questions over here, and that's about the time that we have. So, Gwen? Well, the market is um, certainly driven by supply and demand. How does a um, business that focuses on your business model help with first-time home buyer buyers and deal with the affordable housing shortage? Yeah, the, so that's a great question. So this company called Unison I'm, I'm looking into, I, I find what they're doing to be very interesting. One thing I actually realized I didn't state was about home ownership. One of the biggest problems we're facing right now as a country is student debt. And if you look at the amount of student debt that's occurred and occurring, and then you look at the cost it is to rent. These are two factors economically that are causing people not to be able to come into the buying process. So if I come out of college and I've got $100,000 of student debt, and then I need to rent for a while, but I'm spending 30 to 40% of my income on rent, I can't save enough to be able to get into the home ownership part because the prices are too high. So we have this really sort of bad domino effect. Um, the idea of, and I'm not sure what I feel about this yet, I'm still determining my opinion, but the idea of being able to go to somebody and say, well, we'll give you cash to give you the down payment. You can afford the monthly payments because you're already paying it in rent. We'll give you the cash to give you the down payment, and then we'll essentially win when you sell the property on your appreciation is an interesting way to help put liquidity in the market. And there's a lot of money behind that company doing it. So that's certainly one way. And the other way is we just have to start looking at ways that we can build houses that are less expensive. In San Francisco, by the time you want to go through the permitting process, which takes 18 to 20 months just to try and get a permit, environmental impact reports, and every other possible thing, it's so expensive to build that you can only build luxury properties to recoup a lot of those costs. So there's, we have to have some honest conversations with ourselves about what we can and can't do in order to build more affordable housing in the market. I mean, that's just, that's just fundamentally what every city's facing. All of us are. Good morning. With people moving into storage containers and hotel rooms. That sounded really elegant. Right, right. Uh, and hotel room size uh, spaces, but then buying too much uh, on Amazon. Do you have any opinions on demand for self-storage or mini storage? <laughs> the most interesting question I've ever heard. Are you in the storage business? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, so I have my best friend owns storage, uh, storage companies, so I know that they, uh, they do really well. Um, yeah, like, wow. Uh, by the way, investment tip, storage units or uh, coin car washes, like, make a ton of money. Anyways, so do I have an opinion on it? Yeah, I mean, I think that there, there's certainly value in that because you don't have any space to store anything. Look, the guy's built a 400-square-foot place with the equivalent of 1,000 square feet, but realistically, if you looked at those closets, you can't exactly store much there. So certainly, you're gonna see value in those, in those units, and maybe some of that retail or some of the parking spaces in retail might be converted into storage. Who knows? Um, we also are starting to like, live a little bit more in our means. I think that's, some, that's definitely something on the younger generations, is that they're not accumulating as much you know, stuff that we don't actually need to live with. So I think those are some certainly some trends that we'll see. For sure. Yeah. You are in the storage business, aren't you? Okay. <laughs> Was that it? Okay. Okay. Thank you very Great. much everybody. Thank Appreciate being here. Thank you for being here. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Have a safe trip. So thank you all very much, and um, now's the time that we're going to start our panel presentation. Um, as many of you know, um, if you attended the 10 Barrel event on Tuesday night or have seen the um, presentation online, the Chamber did a community survey um, to identify our residents' um, priorities and concerns. And overwhelmingly, the results of that survey were affordable housing, traffic, and um, growth. And so our panelist and our presentation today is tailored to address those issues with an eye towards the future, obviously, and the inevitable change um, that we will be experiencing as we move to 
through the 2019 and the response to the inevitable growth that we are experiencing. So let's um, please have our panelists take the stage. And um, our panel presentation is a combination of um, presentation style and then guided conversation. So each panelist will have a 10 to 15 minute presentation and then we'll engage in a guided conversation with our panelists afterwards. So um, I'm gonna just let them stay in their seats but tell you who they all are before we get started. Our first panelist will be Mark Butorak. Mark is president of Kittleson and Associates, the regional transportation engineers serving the Pacific Northwest. And Mark will talk to us about curb management and what that can mean for Central Oregon. So if you guys haven't heard this presentation before, you're in for a treat. Our um, next panelist is um, Jeff Patterson. Jeff is a, a, a shareholder, am I still Mike? Shareholder with Schwabi Williamson and Wyatt. It, he, um, his practice focuses on estate planning. Jeff also has an LLM in taxation. Don't let that scare you away though, he's actually kind of fun. Um, and Jeff, <laughs> Jeff's gonna talk to us today about opportunity zones, and um, which are a creation of the Tax and Jobs Act of 2017. We also have Garrett Stevenson. Garrett is a, um, of counsel in Schwabi Williamson and Wyatt's Portland office. Um, for those of you who came two years ago, Garrett came and talked to us about um, inclusionary zoning, which is one of the um, solutions that Portland has proposed for the affordable housing crisis, and he's going to talk to us about how that's going in Portland, as well as um, housing initiatives statewide in the legislature, and um, what's going on with um, housing in general. Um, we also have John Skidmore. John is um, the assistant city manager for the city of Bend, and he's been with the um, city of Bend as the assistant manager for, since 2012. John's going to expand on the legislative bills related to housing, the city's response to those, as well as what's going on in the city of Bend in general. And then lastly, our last panelist is Nick Lelak. Nick is the community development director for the um, Deschutes County, and Nick's going to address hot trends and topics in the county. Again, each will give a 10 to 15 minute presentation, followed by a guided question and answer. But before we um, get to the panelist presentation, now is the time where we're going to do the interactive mentee. Um, we have five questions that we're gonna ask the audience to answer. So if you haven't logged on to mentee yet, please do so quickly. Um, and we're gonna come up, the questions will come up on the screen and um, you'll be asked to answer the questions on your phone through mentee. We'll eventually, some of them have a right answer, some of them don't. But these questions are gonna be used to inform the discussions for the panelists as well as cause you to sort of think about some questions and issues of your own. So if we can start with the first Minty question. So what curb management approach will increase my property value and rents? A, free on street parking. B, paid on street parking. C, dedicated cycle track for cyclists. Sorry about that. Indeed, dynamic curb management, pricing, and or use. I feel like I'm standing in front of the screen. <laughs> How long do I wait? <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. Did, did James leave it? Close. All right. Well, it looks like we have a, and no matter how many of you haven't gone yet, it looks like we're pretty, we're pretty good. Dynamic curb management pricing and or use. Um, are we going to give the correct answer for this one or? That is the correct answer. Great. Thank you. Okay. So then we got question number two. The tax breaks for the opportunity zones include which of the following? Is this forward? We're gonna put that. So, A. Wait. Where's the? A is the. Okay. So A is deferral of capital gains. B is reduction of capital right. gains. C is the elimination of capital gains on some or all of the appreciation on the investment. D is none of the above, or actually, sorry, D is 
all of the above, and E is none of the above. Okay, and the correct answer is all of the above. Okay, next question, true or false? Landlords will be given a window of time to adjust rents after Senate Bill 608 passes, but before the law takes effect. And if, for those of you who don't know, Senate Bill 608 is a rent control. The answer to that one was false. Uh, Senate Bill 608 is going to take effect upon passage, assuming it passes. Okay, so then uh, is this the last one? Should accessory dwelling units be allowed in rural residential zones? So we all know that they are currently allowed within our UGB in the uh, urban residential zones, but should they be allowed in the rural residential zones? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so those three of you who said no, please raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't know that this had a right answer, but um, 211 people think so. <laughs> oh, there's three more of you now. Okay. So that's the end of the mentee questions. We're going to just start it off first with Mark Utorek as the um, first presenter, and then you can just people will just go up afterwards. All right. Good morning. All right. So this is a morning of disruption. Uh, if James didn't disrupt you enough, I'm going to disrupt you a little bit more. But we're going to do a little interactive exercise. So everybody stand up really quick. Got to stretch a little bit. Okay. And don't fall over. If you have a hold of chair, raise your foot about six inches. Okay, you can raise the other one six inches. All right, sit down. So the, uh, the six inches you just raised is the height of a curb, typically in a uh, downtown area uh, or around the country. Sometimes it's a little less, sometimes it's a little bit more. But how many have heard of the word curb management? Before today, okay, you got one, two, three, okay. This is a term you're going to hear a lot about in the next two to three years, uh, and it's already happening ar around the country. And my presentation is just going to talk a little bit about that, how it's going to affect real estate uh, and some rents, uh, but also how it uh, relates to um, autonomous vehicles and uh, other trends that we have going on in transportation. So curb management and fees, uh, we traditionally look at curb as open or closed. Okay, so the, the one on the left, that's an open curb. There's nobody there. The one on the right is a closed curb. There's, there's cars parked there. Okay, so just think about that. Hopefully you've all parked on a curb uh, at some point in your uh, uh, lifetime. So the curb really hasn't changed. So if we look over the last century, the curb's been used for loading and parking. Uh, so in this one, we had our, our uh, wagons that come up unload their, their goods, a uh, carriage comes up, and parks. And that's gone on over time. We've got some Model Ts out there. They park, and we've used it for loading as well. And we've continued on. Now we have our uh, Teslas and Ferraris and electric cars, and they continue to use that curb. Unfortunately, just like James's presentation, disruption's on its way at the curb. So that six-inch piece of concrete that didn't seem too dynamic is going to be getting very dynamic, and how we price it and how we value it uh, is a question that's starting to be asked of professionals like myself and cities along, around the world. And I forgot, asked, forgot to ask John before, has anybody come to ask you about how much your curb's worth in the city of Bend? Not curb specific, no. Not yet, okay. <laughs> it'll, it'll be coming here shortly. So as we go on, we look at the uses of the curb. So parking, we understand that paid parking, free parking. 
Loading, we understand that. But now there is a lot of other uses that are saying, I want to use that curb. First is um, uh, bike lanes or cycle tracks, or now what you're seeing, the scooters. Uh, we don't want the scooters on the sidewalk. We don't want them in the travel lane. We need to find other spaces for them. So um, the, the scooters are looking for some area along with the cyclists as that uh, mode of transportation is picking up. The other is dedicated uh, cycle tracks where you have wider spaces that allow people from two or three years old up to 92 years old to use that, that face and be able to cycle in and out of um, uh, areas to and from work uh, and to various businesses. The other thing, has every, anybody seen street patios or um, eight on a curb? Has anybody done that? Okay, so you're seeing a lot of street patios pop up and restaurants saying, hey, if I could have an extra four tables out in front of my business, it would really make a difference. And finally, the full street patio of having all that space, that extra eight feet used from a retail or a, a service standpoint. And then finally, ride share. And this is where things come together. How many have used Uber or Lyft or another TNC? All right. I know it's more recent over here uh, in Central Oregon, uh, but it's starting obviously to come around uh, in, in the entire United States. So what's critical about this is Uber is going to uh, people like John, and they're asking John a question, how much can I pay to use your curb? So think about that. Why would Uber or Lyft want to pay a city to use their curb. Any thoughts about that? Why, why, would, why would they want to give money to a city for something that's there for the taking? You can't find a parking spot. Ever, so can't find a park. You take them, right? So if you've been reading about the TNCs, where they're going is they are conditioning us to switching from an ownership model to a lease model in cars, okay? So that's the first thing that they're doing. And the other is they're setting um, the stage for autonomous vehicles to run instead of an Uber driver coming out there. Now the critical technological shift is if you've ever gotten an Uber and you're going to a play or you're going to a restaurant um, and there's no curb, what does the Uber driver do? Pulls up double parks, triple parks, and let you out. Do you think the software program in Silicon Valley that's programming that autonomous vehicle is going to say, autonomous vehicle, let people out wherever uh, in travel lanes? No. The liability for GM, Toyota, and all the manufacturers that are uh, in this space, they're basically going to program that car to say it needs to be within 18 inches of a curb before that door opens. Uh, and that is big to their service model. Everything that James talked about this morning with convenience, could you imagine you jump in Uber, you're late for a meeting, you get down there, and the car just starts circling, and it won't open the doors. <laughs> that's bad for business. And that's what Uber and Lyft see right now. And that's why they're coming to cities all around the country mm -hmm. and saying, how much can I pay to have guaranteed access to that curb? And the cities are coming to transportation professionals like us and saying, well, first off, how much curb do we have? John, do you know how much curb the city of Bend has? <laughs> we have 850 miles of lanes, so. Yeah, so maybe double that, that. Double that. And then there's, the, you know, but I, I'll put John on the spot. But most cities across America, if you go in and ask them how much curb they have, they can't answer that question. They can't answer, they can answer how many parking meters they have but they can't answer how much space they have on the curb. So why this is important is a few trends, let's see here, that are going on. And uh, James hit on a few of these, but pickup drop off at the curb is going through the roof and it's gonna continue to go as we get more and more lease vehicles and, and so forth. Loading is going up. Why is that going up? We're all buying from Amazon, so there's more loading, more UPS at the curb. Parking, however, is going down, just like James talked about. And this is a problem for cities um, because that's a revenue generator, and a lot of cities are starting to see revenue drop 
because that curb space isn't generating because people are not parking there as often and, uh, and regular. And then finally, the access to the curb is going up, and that's why, how do we price that curb? So some of the things to start thinking about as a landlord or as a developer is, we used to say, and that was the question I put up this morning, is having on-street parking in front of me, that was the best because theoretically somebody might park there and walk into my business. Now the question is, what if we're pricing that curb and we can dynamically change the curb and how it's used uh, by time of day, day of week, uh, and so forth, time of year, there may be better opportunities. So if you look in downtown Bend, that space of four or five spaces, it may generate a, a few dollars every evening, you know, the turnover rate and so forth like that. If you turn to the restaurant and say, we'll rent you out $20 per table, the city could actually make more revenue and the restaurant could make more revenue because they have more seats. Now that may only operate for a few months out of the year, but how we value that curb is a question of dynamics for both the city from a revenue standpoint and the attractiveness of your business. We're being asked right now all across the country of 25 offices in every city we're being asked by developers, how do I prepare for the autonomous vehicle? And then the question is, how much is it worth to pay to have access to the curb and how does that differenti differentiate my building from other buildings along the way? So wanted to just kind of share that with you. It's coming. And the dynamic use, a lot of people say, well, Mark, how do you change the use of the curb over time? Well, you could do this. In the morning from midnight to 6 a.m., the curb could be parking. From 6 to 8 in the summertime, it could be a bike lane. It could revert back to parking. At lunchtime, it could revert to tables and so forth throughout, throughout the course of the day. And there's technology that can do that. We can actually put crystals in the pavement, hit it with light, and a driver going by will see it is orange or red or yellow throughout the course of the day. And you can charge by the course of the day through technology. So something to think about. Uh, I know James was a little bit of downer on the real estate market, but there's ways to actually make some value uh, on the curb. And you're going to see a lot of that uh, changing here as we go forward. So thank you for uh, the time. And uh, we'll look open for the discussion later this morning. I was hoping when Tia introduced me that she wouldn't use that nasty word, tax. <laughs> so just because the tax attorney is now up here does not mean it's time to check your email on your phone or take a bathroom break. But if you need to, go ahead. So on Friday, December 22nd, 2017, the uh, Tax Cuts and Job Act was signed into law. One of the most sweeping tax changes since 1986. In fact, by noon that day, we were receiving, um, from, our, from various tax services, we were receiving summaries of the new tax law. And the first one I received was 38 pages, bullet points that were about like this, sweeping tax changes. And buried inside this massive tax law was this concept of qualified opportunity zones, and qualified opportunity funds. So it's two sections of the tax code that, that work in tandem. So Internal Revenue Code 1400Z1 is the qualified opportunity zone. Now, when I'm talking to a room full of real estate professionals, we think of zones and zoning. This is not a restriction. This is an area. This is an area where investment can be put into. So what happened with the zones were from, from the day the law was passed, the state government had 90 days to propose these zones. The zones were, were defined as low-income communities. And under the Internal Revenue Code, that has, that, it's, a, it's a calculation of the, in, the, in the area, a certain percentage of the household incomes had to be 80% of the median income for that area. 
So these zones were proposed by the states to the Secretary of the U.S. Treasury. 90 days. 90 days to, de to designate these zones. And that's all we have. In tandem with that is the Qualified Opportunity Fund. So a Qualified Opportunity Fund is also a very dense section of the code where 90% of the investments in the fund have to be invested in a Qualified Opportunity Zone. Everybody just glazed over. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how does the... Uh-oh. There we go. This is what happens when you give the clicker to a tax attorney. So what are, what are the tax breaks? When, when, we, when we talk about avoiding the sale, avoiding taxes on the sale of a capital gain asset, typically real estate professionals go to the 1031 tax-free like-kind exchange. This is tons better than that. So the capital gain. What is the capital gain? You have your basis in the property and then the sale price. The gain is the difference between your basis and the sale price. So the tax break is if you sell a capital gain asset, you take the gain and you invest it in a qualified opportunity fund that in turn invests in a qualified <coughs> opportunity zone. So it's not the entire sale price that has to be invested. It's just the gain. And if that's done, then you defer the gain, you defer the taxes on that gain. If the investment is then held for 10 years, and then that investment is sold, you avoid the tax on that too. So for, if there's any tax professionals in the room, how does that work? You get to step up the basis on the investment at the time of sale after you've held it for 10 years. What in the world does that mean? You then get to take the, the, the value as of the day that it's sold. That's the new basis. That's how you avoid the gain. So it's tax-free on sale, hold it for 10 years, tax-free on sale on the back end. When you think of a 1031 exchange, we're just really kicking the can down the road, right? Because at some point, you got to pay the piper. Here, as long as you fall within these parameters, it's tax-free on the front end, tax-free on the back end. This is huge. This is quite possibly what a lot of articles are calling the, the next big thing in real estate. And this, this is having massive impacts in many areas of the country, one of those being our neighbor over in the valley, Portland. I've, I've been involved in a, in a couple of these things where we're talking between $250 million and $500 million projects. It's huge. So, the zones. Just in central Oregon, that's, that's the broad picture we have. Well, I'm like, oh, clickers. Back, <laughs> back. See, I warned you. So, ah, here we go. So, Bend, Redmond, and then over in Crook County, there's Prineville. Back around, I mean, the, the huge rural area that is a qualified opportunity zone. Just to kind of give you a perspective, Prineville, Brasada Ranch is down in this area. That up at top, that's the border between Jefferson County and Crook County. It's an enormous area. So look a little closer. Bend. Keep in mind, this is a low income community zone. We basically have the, can I get the clicker to work? My, no. There we go. So there's the river. So that winds around the Chutes River 
up to the Butler Market area, down, I think that's mm, maybe 6th Street, over to Neff, all the way out to 27th. Then there's a little hitch right there, down <laughs> Pettigrew to Reed Market Road. All a qualified opportunity zone in Bend. Redmond, and I, I don't know this one as well, all these different streets, if I can get my, see, tax attorney, clicker. Um, you look at that, that includes all of the airport, back around, up towards Antler, takes in 126 where the high school is, then this was the other big one. Whoops. Going back to Crook County. There we go. Again, that's Brasada Ranch right in there, Powell Butte Highway. Around, I think that's probably Millican Road up into Prineville. Around, up towards Jefferson County. There, there are, I didn't take the time to put them in, but there's, there's a, another opportunity zone up in Madras, and then one farther up towards Warm Springs. So there's huge opportunities here, and they're just in our own community. I mean, it includes the, the, the Bend section, the Third Street Corridor that has been you know, a target for revitalization in there. There's, there's huge areas here. And do I think it's the next big thing? I think it's enormous. When you talk about being able to sell the, sell the capital gain asset on the front end, avoid the gain, invest it in these qualified funds, qualified zones, hold it for 10 years, develop the property, and then sell it on the back end, it's a huge opportunity. And we're watching it happen in Portland right now. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. I do not have a PowerPoint. I'm a little old school like that. So um, I'm going to pretend to be like Jeff was and kind of walk around as if I did have a PowerPoint. Um, but I have my trusty notes here uh, as a prop because they're details to talk about. Uh, my name's Garrett. I am a land use lawyer from Portland's um, Schwabi office. And uh, I was here two years ago to talk about what was then a brand new program that the city had initiated called inclusionary housing. And it was an interesting presentation because there are so many details to this program. I was kind of watching a lot of people in the audience sort of glaze over and we're talking about, oh, is it 10% affordable here or 20% affordable there? And then um, I remember saying that there's a buyout option and that buyout option was gonna cost $40 uh, per gross square foot. And then all of a sudden I hear gas and everybody went white. And uh, so when Tia asked me to, to pick a topic um, this year, uh, being a lawyer and terrible at picking topics, I said, why don't we just go back and see if I can make everybody turn white again um, by saying something super extreme um, that is also real. Uh, I hate to say it, but um, I don't have any zingers for you when it comes to inclusionary housing. But what I'm gonna do is I'll give you a quick reminder for those of you who weren't here or weren't paying attention or who simply don't care, what inclusionary housing is, and then um, I will uh, tell you how the city's program has gone. And um, one of the other interesting things that's happened since I agreed to, to speak today and, uh, and this moment is that the legislature has um, made some fundamental shifts in um, the laws governing things like rent control and uh, single family zoning. And when I say they've made these shifts, I, I suppose I'm saying it's a fait accompli that these bills will pass, but they still might not. So who knows? But I'll go ahead and spice it up a bit today by talking about those bills. Um, 
So Portland's inclusionary housing program, and some of you might be familiar with the concept of inclusionary zoning. It's the same thing. It's simply a label that the city chose. The city's inclusionary housing program requires the city, um, or excuse me, requires developers to provide a certain percentage of multifamily housing that they're building um, in such a way that it's affordable for people of different incomes. The, the takeaway and the thing to remember about Portland's program is that it looks for both a sort of a deep and wide uh, approach to affordability. The deep affordability option, if you're a developer and you want to go in and build, say, a condo building or apartment, and yes, it does apply to, to condos, so sold multifamily as well. But what you can do is you can choose between a deep affordability option, which is reserving 10% of those units that you're building to be affordable for those making 60% or less of medium family income. The broad affordability mark is 20% of the units you're building affordable to 80, somebody making 80% of the median family income. That was the original proposal, and it was going to apply citywide. What the city has found is that while that might be sort of palatable in the central city, it is not palatable outside of the central city. So outside of the central city, and here I'm going to refer to my notes for the details, uh, outside of the central city, you have a requirement for either 8% of the units reserved for 60% MFI or 15% of the units reserved for 80% of the MFI. So what the city's recognized as this has gone into effect is that um, you can't necessarily make projects pencil very easily outside of the central city. So we're not going to uh, impose upon developers such an onerous uh, affordability requirement. That has now been extended to 2021. Um, the incentives that are offered are actually pretty wide-ranging. Um, if you comply with the inclusionary housing requirements, you get a 10-year property exemption on the affordable, uh, property tax exemption on the affordable units. And have any of you heard of the multiple unit limited tax exception or multi? Um, it's a statewide program that has basically been imported into the city's code, and that helps them pay for that. Uh, there's a construction excise tax exemption, FAR bonuses, and if you're doing the deep affordability option, um, you get an SDC exemption for those units. So that was kind of the overview I gave two years ago. We've now seen this being implemented, and we've seen some of its effects, although we haven't actually been able to identify those effects as much as we would like. So um, one of the fascinating things that happened, and this is sort of intuitive, as um, the program was passed by the city council and they said, all right, we're going to implement this by February 1 of 2017, a huge glut of permits came in the door. And it's just an astonishing number. So between February of 2017 and, or excuse me, between March of 2016 and February 1 of 2017, 19,000 multifamily units were brought in for permitting at the city of Portland. That's just an astonishing amount, even for Portland, um, even in this kind of upswing that we had at the time. Um, so what that did is it front-loaded a massive amount of multifamily inventory, and we are not even close to working through it. Uh, the city estimates that's four to five years' worth of multifamily production. Right now, uh, conservatively, they're guessing that something like 8,300 of these units are still in some form of the permitting process. So um, the question always comes up, how has inclusionary housing impacted the housing market and impact, specifically impacted the housing supply? The big concern in Portland was, what is this going to do to our supply of housing? Is it going to make these projects no longer pencil? We can't build them less is getting built, supply and demand curve gets sort of inverted, and we have a big problem with housing affordability all over again. Um, and it's frankly and unfortunately for you guys today, it's too early to tell. So what the city has said is that there's been something like 2,700 units being proposed after the effective date of inclusionary housing. 
And of these projects, I believe 36 are private, seven are subsidized by the Portland Housing Bureau. What the city didn't say is whether or not those 36 private projects were also for affordable housing. So it's really hard to tease out whether these are market rate or, um, or more affordable type projects. But I mean, clearly, within one year you have 19,000 units. The following year and a half you have 2,700 units being proposed. So um, it's difficult to suss out, is this people trying to avoid inclusionary housing? Is it by the simple fact that there's so many units in the pipeline um, that we really have no reason to be proposing anymore right now? Um, the other issue is that we've actually seen rents fall in Portland. Um, I believe that uh, the growth rate in rents have fallen 2% and we're looking at a residential vacancy rate of something like 7 to 8%. So um, when it comes to inclusionary housing, it, it is very difficult to say what the long-term impact will be. Um, certainly I don't think it's going to mean that we will never have a viable multifamily product type in Portland. People will figure out how to make this work for their pro formas. Um, but it's coming online at a time of market retraction. We're seeing, uh, again, a glut of units and also a softening demand for units. So um, time will tell. Maybe the chamber will have me out in another two years and I will be able to tell you we still don't know. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's kind of where we're at. And uh, I will say, just in my own practice, what our clients have told me is that they would do anything uh, if they could to avoid inclusionary housing if, you know, if the option's available. A lot of our clients attempted to do this early vesting thing um, simply because, as uh, James mentioned earlier, the cost of producing this housing is so high that you need to produce a certain product type in order to make these projects pencil. So what do I think the city needs to do, which it has not really been doing a, a whole ton of, is really get a handle on SDCs, permitting fees, timelines, and that sort of thing. Um, but that's the news from Lake Wobegon. Uh, let's talk about the two 800-pound um, gorillas in the room. New legislation coming down this year. And do I think it'll pass? Yes, I think it will pass. Um, two bills in particular. Um, the first bill is Senate Bill 608. Um, that is the, what has been called either the no cause uh, eviction bill or the rent control bill um, proposed by Tina Kotek among others. Um, this is exactly what it sounds like. Um, no cause evictions are gonna be outlawed except for if you're selling the property, um, moving in a landlord or family member or for repairs. Um, if you do, for some reason, choose as a landlord to evict somebody for any of these reasons, you're gonna owe them one month's rent. Uh, a lot of this is based on Portland's own rental relocation program, which similarly restricts no causes of evictions, but forces you to pay them something like three months rent. It's a very, very expensive program in Portland. Um, but the rent control piece of this is not as bad as I think everybody was worried um, it might be, depending on which side of the fence you fall. The rent control, and this is a statewide rent control, this is not just Portland, it's going to be the increase in the consumer price index plus 7%. What does that mean? It means for a back of the napkin sketch, inflation plus 7%. Um, now, I wanna put this in perspective. In some other markets, like say, certain types of rent control programs in the Bay Area um, and some other states that have it, you're restricted to inflation only. So this is not gonna be a situation where I can only increase the rents of my tenants by inflation. There is some wiggle room, that 7%. Um, but the thing that, that I found the most fascinating part of this bill, and it, it clearly was an interesting question for you folks, was, all right, so we know this is coming down the pike. What if you have a bunch of renters that are way below market? Um, I think a lot of landlords' first instincts are gonna be, well, I need to get those folks back up to a market level. Um, that's not gonna be very easy to do because this bill uh, has attached to it an emergency clause. It will become effective on passage. And I would guess um, it should be passed within the next couple of months, if not sooner. So um, that's what my takeaway was from this, is that 
you're not going to have um, a, a really long implementation time for rent control to come into effect. But there again, 7% um, above CPI, maybe not the um, most extreme form of rent control that we could have ended up with. Um, the last bill I want to talk about is House Bill 2001. And um, everybody told me this gets rid of single family zoning throughout the state. And I said, oh, yeah, sure, all right. Um, I'll believe it when I see it. And then I actually went online and I read the bill. Um, and I guess it depends on how you define single family zoning. Um, House Bill 2001 requires local governments um, of medium plus size jurisdictions, uh, I think it's towns over 10,000 and counties over 15,000 in population, requires them to allow in, in what are currently their single family zones, at least one type of what's called middle housing. That is duplexes, triplexes, quadruplexes, or cottage clusters. Um, cottage clusters was a new term for me, uh, but what it is are, you know, where you have a, a larger property and a bunch of cottages on it. Um, so simple enough. Uh, does this get rid of single family zoning? If you take the word single in single family zoning seriously, I guess you could read it that way. Um, pretty soon we are going to have zones in the state of Oregon that give you a by right duplex or triplex or quadruplex or cot cottage cluster on, um, on each property. Uh, and I, you know, I think that this will give a lot of people more flexibility, especially in urban areas, to increase density. Um, but the consumer real estate implications of this, I have no idea. Um, one good thing here that, incidentally, the home builders put in there was that the SDCs, if you're building one of these projects, are payable on occupancy only. So you don't have to pay your SDCs when you go in and ask for your permit. You can wait until occupancy. When you know you've got a building, you can have occupied, pay your SDCs at that time. So um, these are the two, I think, most important housing bills coming down right now. Uh, they both look to me like they're going to pass, but uh, I've been wrong before, and I'll keep being wrong periodically. Um, the, you know, when I was here two years ago, there was a proposal for rent control that, um, that ultimately did not pass, and I said, I, I bet it passes. Now I, I think that it's a lot more likely, simply because of the makeup of the legislature. So um, that's my report. I wish I could give you more answers on what all of this will mean, but what it will mean is that things are going to get a lot more complicated and interesting as all these new policies come into effect at the same time. Thanks. Nice job, Garrett. waiting for this to sync with uh, the screen behind me. But uh, for those who don't know me, my name is John Skidmore. I'm the Assistant City Manager. I spend most of my time working with the departments that collectively manage growth in our fine city of Bend. And I'm going to talk mostly about housing and transportation today. Um, and actually, before I get going, on your tables, Scott, would you mind picking up? There's a, a spreadsheet that we put on everybody's table that shows the uh, 2018 year-end uh, permitting statistics for the city, so everything from single-family, multi-family, uh, engineering permits, planning, so if you're interested, take a peek. Um, but uh, housing is a huge issue for us here in the city of Bend, as it is statewide. Garrett was mentioning the amount of activity uh, in the legislature. Our lobbyist sends us a summary of bills when they're dropped uh, each legislative session, and we have uh, small little paragraphs of summaries for each bill. We had nine pages of summaries for the housing bills that were dropped two weeks ago. So we will be swimming in, in housing legislation here in Oregon for years to come, if I could get the uh, graph back up. So to localize a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, let's look at what Ben's situation is in housing. And so AMI, area median income, 100% of area median income here in Bend is for a family of four is roughly $70,000. Um, as you can see, as you go to the left of the, of the graph there, 
we've got deficits of housing needs for folks that are earning less than 60% of AMI. So basically, we're about 5,000 units short of folks who are on the lower end of the income spectrum. What that does is it creates a situation where if you're making 60% of AMI and you find a willing landlord who's <coughs> going to rent you something that's really geared for somebody making 80% or 100% of AMI, you're going to take the chance. You're paying rent for a few weeks, a few months, things are going well, something happens to your car, you're out of money, you need to choose between rent and food, you choose food, you're back on the street or living in your car that might be broken. So our, our old affordable housing manager used to call that the cycle of poverty or the cycle of homelessness. So for us as a community to really shore up our housing need, we really need to figure out how to fund housing on that very low end of the income spectrum. Um, I believe our average sales price of a home now is 420000 something in that range. Uh, when you're making $70,000 for a family of four, that just doesn't really work too well. Um, so let's move on. I think this is a, an interesting chart. This shows area median income in the blue and orange. Blue is 80%. Orange gets you up to 100%. And so as you can see, we have the black line. That is the average sales price of a home over the past eh, 13 years now. Um, when, when we were in the depths of the recession, the AMI and the value of the homes kind of worked okay. Uh, but now that we've popped back out of it, even if you're making 100% AMI, uh, that means you can afford roughly a, a home of $275,000, $300,000. The, the homes that are on the market are roughly eh, $150,000, $200,000 above that. So it's a very tough equation to work out. Uh, I think a problem for Ben specifically is roughly 75% of our housing stock is single family detached. We just don't have a lot of multifamily. We don't have a lot of duplexes, triplexes, cottage, cluster housing. Um, anybody here ever live in an apartment? Yeah, they're, they're not so bad. Good people come out of apartments, right? And we seem to have a <laughs> tough time adjusting to multifamily coming to bed. We need it if we want to continue to thrive. One of the things I hear consistently from our business community is we can't recruit people because we have nowhere to house them. If we don't have the right housing stock to match the income levels that we have in Central Oregon, let's face it, we, we don't pay the best. We, we, we have good incomes, but they're not super high. So we really need to adjust our housing supply to what we actually have. So I think this is a really cool slide. It shows you what the various income levels are at different AMI levels and what you can afford, as well as what types of, um, of careers you might be working in earning those, those amounts. Even if you're making 120% of the area median income, which is about $85,000, you can still only afford a home price of $320,000. Again, $100,000 below the average sales price. You can afford rent of uh, $2,100 a month. Um, yeah, you're going to be able to find some housing stock in that area, but, but not a whole lot. I think that's the last slide. Yep. So just going to go through a few of the things that we're doing locally. Um, here in Bend to address the housing issues. And, and uh, James mentioned that the localities really need to take a, I would say, a, a leadership position in, in doing what they can with their local codes to try to encourage a wider array of housing types. So what has the city done? Back in 2006, the city was the first city in the state to adopt an affordable housing fee. That's a small percentage of every residential permit that's pulled. Um, since 2006, we have leveraged over 1,200 units of uh, deed-restricted affordable housing. 500 in the last five years alone. We have another 200 in the pipeline. Uh, the city went after a pilot project that the legislature passed, um, I think it was 2017 or 2016, House Bill 4079 that allowed us to expand our UGB by roughly 50 acres. And that's on the east side of town, just south of uh, Worthy Brewing, a little bit east. You'll see roughly 200 plus um, affordable housing units, anywhere from 60% to 80% to 100% of AMI. Uh, we do have an SDC exemption program that we've had on the books for deed restricted uh, units at 80% or less. Um, at sunsets in 2023, it's been a pretty powerful tool. Uh, since January of last year of 2018, we've exempted $570,000 worth of SDCs, and that's leveraged 89 units. We've also worked with um, Bethlehem Inn, Core Community Land Trust, Canal Commons, and some other projects. Our UGB that we adopted in 2016 does require a wider mix of housing in master planned areas. So you are going to be required to try to shift the needle from 75% single family detached to a wider array of housing units. 
We also have expansion areas where folks coming in were lobbying to be included in the UGB and offered up certain percentages of houses at different levels at AMI. So there are targets that expansion areas have to meet in order to be annexed. One area actually was uh, proposed and was approved for 30% of AMI. That's going to be a tough project for them to work out, but those are the types of projects that we'll be seeing. We do have a cottage housing code. Um, I think in the past four years or so, we've seen about 100 units come out of that. It hasn't really hit the market as hot as we thought it would. I think where we've really seen the needle move a bit is with accessory dwelling units. And let's face it, the city's in social science. We have the ability to tune and refine how we do things. We've had the ability to do accessory dwelling units since 2000. From 2000 to 2016, I think we only had hold on a second, yep, 153 units of ADUs permitted citywide. So in 16 years, we had 153. In 2016, we went back and looked at the conditional use requirement and we lowered the SDC on transportations. From 2016 to 2018, we saw 166 ADUs permitted. Last year, we went back again and we looked at the sidewalk requirement to see if we really wanted that. We also looked at the height requirement. So we allowed a higher ADU. We got rid of the sidewalk requirement. Since June of 2018, we've seen 66 units approved. So if we can make these short tweaks in terms of what our policies and procedures are, you can see some things, some really good benefit. Uh, the one thing I have to keep, everybody should keep in mind, I've heard a lot of people talk about land being the, the uh, issue and really the solution for more housing. We could annex from here to the Columbia River and it wouldn't matter. What we need is the infrastructure to serve it. We've got infrastructure is extremely expensive. When our, when our Oregon land use system was created in the 70s, infrastructure was really cheap because the feds were paying for streets, they were paying for water systems, they were paying for sewer systems. Now we all get to pay for that. And so you can bring in as much land as you want, but if it's not serviceable, it's really not going to address any of your employment land needs or any of your, uh, your housing needs. The other uh, focus of council has been on transportation. If I could get the, the PowerPoint back up. They made two really big decisions in the past two years, $60 million worth of road projects. This is the Murphy Road uh, corridor. We will begin the summer at point number four, where there will be a roundabout at 15th and Murphy. We're going to start heading west make our way over the train track and out toward Brosser House. Um, what's amazing to me is between Murphy Road on the north going all the way south to Knott and then west of 15th and east of the railroad, between the school district, the parks district, and the city, there's roughly a, qu a quarter of a billion dollars worth of public investment in that corridor. So there's a new park, there's two new schools, and there's a $30 million road. So, it's incumbent upon the private property owners out there to leverage that public investment to get the types of housing and employment needs that we are desperately in need of here in Bend. The other big um, project is Empire. I love the snow, glad to see that it came. It would have been great if it had come this last Monday when we were supposed to start the uh, roundabout at Purcell and Empire. That's now <laughs> been delayed. But uh, that roundabout at Purcell and Empire will be in by June, and then we will begin uh, We'll begin uh, working east across uh, the park. We'll be putting in a roundabout at um, 27th and Butler Market. We'll be putting in a roundabout at Butler Market and Purcell, or perhaps just looking at the, the signal timing, but making significant investments in the infrastructure that's going to open up uh, different areas of town that, that have the ability for employment lands and, most importantly, housing. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Nick. Thanks, sir. Good morning, thank you. It's great to be here. And I'm going to back clean up this morning, and I'm going to conclude with uh, the theme of disruptions again. You're going to see it. I, and some of these, uh, the slides I'm going to show could be considered zingers or, or may not, uh, based, on, based on your perspectives. Um, and I'm going to cover population and some of the changes in our population forecast, some development trends, and then I'm going to conclude with, with just a snapshot of some of the hot topics in Deschutes County. We don't have enough time in my presentation to cover those, but we'll be more than happy to, to talk about those in, in Q&A. So with population, some changes occurred a couple of years ago. The legislature adopted a bill that effectively took the population forecasting away from counties and gave it to, the Portland, to Portland State University and to their population research center. It's, it's actually great in all regards. And a couple of years ago, I presented the first population forecast, 2015 to 2065. We were at 170,000 people at the time, projected to about double in, in 50 years. Well, 
okay, what can, what can possibly change in three years? But we went from a 400,000 scale on the previous one to a 500,000 scale on this one. They're now project projecting that we're going to grow to 432,000 by the year 2068. And I'll go into some of the, the changes in just a moment. Why, why, what changed in the forecast? But no matter how you look at it, that's a significant difference. And the other thing that's very significant is that we have grown 17,600 and some odd just over the last couple of years. Well, to put that into perspective, that's half of the city of Redmond and all of the city of Sisters. We've grown again just in the past uh, three years. So where are, the, where are these people going to live? Most of them, over 90% of the growth is going to be in our cities. Very little population is projected in the rural county over the, the population forecast. And I highlight 2030 because if we think about from the beginning of time until 2030, we have, we have a, a, most, of our uh, most of our urban growth boundaries fully developed. The infill, the cottages, our newly expanded areas have, have built out and have, have developed. And then from 2030 to 2068, we're going to do it all over again. They're going to double. Think about the city of Bend at 123,000. Current UGB is designed for a little bit less than that, or maybe a little, it's, it's, a, it's about that number for 2030. It's going to more than double that in the next 38 years. And this is going to be the case for each of our cities. Now, I, I did provide five-year increments from 2018 to 2043 for the main reason that one of the changes that Portland State University made, the population research made, is the methodology. They put a lot more emphasis on the front end of that 50-year forecast, so it's a lot more accurate. They're looking at national trends, they're looking at local trends, they're looking at a lot of data. So this is a lot more accurate in the, in the front end of the first, the first 25 years. Then they extrapolate that, they continue that uh, for the next 25 years. The other big changes that they acknowledge in the report, and they're both available online, is that Central Oregon came roaring out of the economy, uh, out of the recession, excuse me, far greater, far faster than they initially anticipated. And they're expecting significant growth between 2018 and 2025, which then increases the, the, the population projections overall. Now, how do we compare to others? I just, so we're going to grow by a quarter of a million people over the next 50 years. I just wanted to give you a snapshot of Crook and Jefferson counties. But what's interesting is if we look at a couple of other I-5 corridor counties, Marion County, for those of you who don't know, that's Salem. That's uh, just south of Portland. So... Uh, you can see they grow by 175,000. Jackson County, their population forecast, the, the PSU doesn't do all the forecasts every year. They, they stagger them. 2017 to 2067, grows by 101,000. We blow by Jackson County in the 2040s when we look at the, when we look at the numbers. And then Lane County um, also increases. But what's, what's particularly surprising, it's not so much that we're growing faster, it's that Generally, and that's not uncommon for, for relatively smaller population counties, but what is surprising is by how much more we're growing in just in terms of total population. Now, the other is uh, population comparisons. Ho-hum, we're the fastest growing county again. Um, these are the latest numbers that just came out in December. But what's surprising is, again, is how much faster we are growing than all other uh, counties in the state. And then when we look at our comparisons with... Uh, Total population growth. We're number fourth. We're number four in the state behind the, the three Portland metro counties, well above Marion County, Lane County, Jackson County, and others. So that just gives you a perspective of the magnitude of growth that we're going to experience in Deschutes County and and in our cities. I'm going to shift gears quickly to uh, some development data. If you're in the field and you are uh, you're having inspectors, you're going to see one of our smiling faces here up in the. Uh, in your upper right-hand corner come out. If you're involved in a land use proceeding, don't be surprised if you have a large case file. Uh, I'm not sure if our Brooks Resources folks are here, but this is, this is the Miller Tree Farm on, on the right, and then a Big Sky uh, expansion on the left. A lot of people are interested in land use and uh, everything that we're doing, whether it be parks or housing or economic development. So a, a snapshot of some development statistics. Now, this is going to be rural Deschutes County and the cities of Sisters and Lapine, which is where we have uh, building jurisdiction. Single-family homes have often been a snapshot or just a benchmark of growth in, in the rural county. And this gives you a, a sense of where we're at today. We have a heat map that shows where that growth is occurring, where we're seeing the most single-family homes. So it's going to be Sisters, Tethero, uh, 
new homes in Deschutes River Woods, many of those are going to be replacement homes, and in Sun River and Caldera Springs. So those are going to be some of the hotspots. And you can see Lapine as well. Um, Lapine has really taken off. Uh, total building per permits, however, um, have been significantly greater. And so these, this is going to include commercial buildings. This will include alterations, additions, expansions. And so where are we seeing this? Um, Black Butte Ranch, Sun River, Deschutes River Woods again, Tethero, Tumalo, um, and uh, Pronghorn, some in Alfalfa, and, and then on the, on the west side of Redmond. So you get a sense of where people are investing in their properties with, with building permits. And then new commercial buildings, uh, primarily you're going to see those because we don't allow those in, in the rural county uh, per state law. Uh, you're going to see Pronghorn, uh, east side of Bend, some of those are going to be at the Bend Airport. Tumalo, Sisters, and Lapine again. It gives you a snapshot of where some of the new commercial buildings are located. Land use applications, now here, we're close to where we were uh, prior to the Great Recession. Uh, big numbers, big numbers there, and then where are we seeing those applications? Northwest of Bend, Tumalo, but those are really going to be scattered across um, the area that Deschutes County has land use jurisdiction, um, which is only about 18 to 20 percent of the rural county outside of the cities and excluding uh, federal lands. This has been the game changer for us. People love this place. People call us every day to tell us how much they love this place and how much they want their neighbor to clean up their property. Um, <laughs> and we've in increased code enforcement. I know the city of Bend, your numbers are similar to this. This is very, very common. Um, and I think it, it, it's because, and often these trends, as we, if we were to go back into the recession, if, and we, prior to the recession, these trends often mirror the, the economy and real estate transactions in the county. But holy smokes, is this a resource demand? And we're here, we, we feel, we experience, we see greater um, aggression on both sides of this. The people that are cleaned it up, we're tired of looking at it, we have different expectations, and the other side is, well, we've been doing this forever, you've never been here, and our response is we haven't had a complaint, and we're not out looking for, for, for issues. So some of the hot topics, we're looking at this next year. We, we see the development to be stable. This is going to be rural county sisters and in Redmond, but stable, I would say, at a healthy level, at, at a sustained level. If you're involved in a land use proceeding in, in any of our jurisdictions, except uh, not as much in, in Lapine or Redmond probably, expect significant public involvement. People are going to engage because they care. Major road, road, road projects, you saw the front page of today's bulletin. There's the project, and uh, one of our esteemed members of the panel is quoted there on the front page in the Terrebonne project. Uh, Deschutes County, uh, the state of Oregon uh, consultants are involved in major transportation uh, road projects in Tumalo and in Terrebonne um, to address growth. That's exactly what, what the key issues are. The future of solid waste. This is an ongoing discussion with the county. Keep, keep it or ship it. And I think you can find more information on our website about that, and people have strong opinions about that. Those, none of those decisions have been made, but we do know that our, uh, our solid waste facilities will be maxed out here in about 10 years, and so we need to begin to make those decisions in, in short order. Significant growth in Redmond, and, and they're going to continue to charge forward at a rapid pace. This next week, the Board of County Commissioners will meet with the Redmond City Council in a joint public hearing for yet another urban growth boundary expansion. It's going to be 700 acres for large lot industrial and expansion of the fairgrounds and others. A lot of resort um, and residential developments. We're going to see uh, Caldera Springs, south of Sun River, double in size. Uh, Thornburg Destination Resort south of Eagle Crest is still going through the appeal process a dozen to 15 years after they, they started the process, but they're getting close, and that could really begin to take off probably closer to, 20, uh, uh, to 2021. Uh, and the West Side Transect uh, recently approved on the West Side of Bend, and, and uh, be, we're already meeting with them about their plans uh, to develop that property. We're also seeing and experiencing significant interest in Sisters and in Lapine. While we don't have land use jurisdiction, we do have buildings, so we're often engaged with both cities, and there's a lot of interest in both communities. And I think going forward, given where we started uh, with Tia this morning about the survey that was just released and the fact that people care so much about this place and the changes that come with growth, so much of what we're going to have to do in our, in our planning department, the city I'm sure is experiencing the same thing, is balance, balance, balance. Balancing growth and development with quality of life. Balancing growth and development with, with natural hazards planning, with natural resources. Um, balancing 
allowing public input and meaningful and engagement, engaged public input with processes, uh, permitting processes that we need to streamline to the extent that we can, but we can't do so at the, ex um, at the expense of public engagement. So we're going to do what we can there. One of the things that we've just kicked off is a weekly land use activity update. We're going to create a monthly development update. You can subscribe to these um, either by texting CDD ATA, which is, stands for Community Development Data, um, to this number, 22828, or you can sign up online, and then you can also unsubscribe as well. So with that, I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you very much, and we'll turn it over to the panel. Thank you, Nick. Right. Um, so now's the time for Q&A. We're going to do the um, same setup on either side of the room if you want to ask a question, but Katie's going to start us off with a question for the panel. So my question for the panel, um, and, and I think that any one of you could probably answer this, uh, just a word of advice. If you were um, a developer, and let's say that you are looking at uh, building multifamily housing, um, duplex or above, fill in the blank. What advice would you give on timing? What advice would you give on, um, I guess, well, let's stay away from location. Let's just talk about timing and how you set yourself up and how you bring the players together during such a very, very different time during the legislature and in the market with the market forces that are going on. What advice would you give to this group in bringing more multi-use or multi-housing on board? Well, um, I will take a stab at it, um, and I'm not going to tell you what I think because uh, if I were a great developer, I wouldn't uh, have to be a lawyer. Um, but <laughs> I will tell you what people have told me, and this is, I want to put some brackets around this. This is very specific to the Portland market. Um, the smart money is on dialing back on multifamily production. Um, that seems self-evident when you're talking about a town like Portland because there's like 20,000 units coming down the pipeline already. Um, and I think a lot of people want to see how um, these new policies uh, shake out, mix and match with each other. Um, so I don't know if that's necessarily the right answer for Bend or Central Oregon. Um, here's the deal. Uh, you can try and control growth, but until the state of Oregon lets local governments decide who and who can't live there, you're going to have growth. And it's, there's nothing that any of us up on the panel can do about it except um, try and accommodate that growth as best we all can. Um, so I think that uh, I subscribe to the, because it's simple and I can understand it, I subscribe to the supply and demand theory of housing, and that is actually starting to really show its feathers in Portland where you have decreasing rents. So these overpriced luxury apartments are now maybe not as overpriced as they once were. And so the question always is, um, what kind of product do we produce? Well, um, there is an economist named Joe Courtright, and he um, has a really cool blog called City Observatory. And I'm paraphrasing what he would say, but I think what he would say is that you need to produce. Um, that is the first order of business when it comes to multifamily housing. So um, if, there are, if, you, if there is a high demand in, in, the, in central Oregon, I think that um, the winners are going to be the ones who are around to accommodate that demand. Um, but I think that at least in the short term, I would want to let somebody out, you know, go out and find all the problems with these new policies um, before it's me. Um, that's, that's, that's my own take on it. But the people who get in early and know how to deal with these policies or have a good theory about it, um, those are going to be the most successful. So there's my answer that is probably a non-answer. Um, but I think the question recognizes that there's a lot of mm -hmm. interesting things going on right now and nobody really knows how it's all going to shake out. I'll take a stab at it. Um, first of all, I, if you look at the stats that we provided, uh, I think we had 700 units of single family um, approved last year and somewhere around 200 of multifamily. We're seeing a good amount of multifamily um, trickling in, but say 900 units were created, I think that leaves us deficient by anywhere between 600 and 1,100. We need about 1,500 units 
over the next few years to kind of keep up with demand and, and catch up to it, uh, and that's housing of all types. So if you're gonna if you're gonna strike out on a multifamily project, um, hire a good consultant team. Uh, get a great public involvement consultant to help you. Uh, as much as we like to think that we're an inclusive community, uh, when you see things like Evergreen and the amount of public resistance that came um, along with that, you're going to have an uphill battle to win over the public's um, support for your project. And even if you're zoned for multifamily, um, it's not a popularity contest. You've got criteria that you need to meet. You can be meeting all the criteria and still be getting appealed. So it comes down to the age-old game of can the appellants outlast the developer? So if you can do whatever you can do to meet with the neighbors, meet with the neighborhood associations, speak with the, the stakeholders that are gonna be loud and in your face, understand what their needs are and see if you can address them. Um, because sitting in Luba, which is the Land Use Board of Appeals, that's essentially how you appeal land use uh, decisions here in Oregon, um, it's really a drain on resources for the developer. At a certain point in time, uh, fending off lawsuit after lawsuit becomes less um, palatable and uh, makes the project uh, not pencil as well. So do your due diligence, get a good, um, get a good consultant team together, and do your public outreach. As a, um, as a developer's attorney, I can echo some of what John said. Um, I, I handled one such case where they were permitted outright in the neighborhood and it was an apartment complex and the neighborhood was entirely opposed. And we ended up, up at Luba. Um, we ultimately resolved it by offering the neighborhood transportation improvements outside of the boundaries of our project because that was their concern. And the only way we were going to resolve that was to meet with the neighbors and try to get at their concerns. Oftentimes it's not necessarily more density it's the impacts that the density brings. And if you as a developer can find ways to bridge that gap and, and find ways to bring the neighborhood to the table, find out what the impacts are that they're really concerned about and a way to address them, oftentimes your money is better spent investing in the, in the uh, solution rather than continuing to fight the battle. Any questions from the audience? I, I would like to ask one last question that it links to something the city of Bend is in the middle of right now, the transportation system plan, and that how inextricably linked our transportation system is to how we sell houses, how we buy houses, where we live, and how we get around. And this had a lot to do with the survey that Hubble um, and the chamber did on growth um, and the issue of congestion. So Mark Butorek, my question to close this out is to you. Oh. I know. Going, yeah, it's all your fault, dude. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> when you look at like-sized communities like Bend, um, so let's let's take this out of the Portland box because that's yep. just a different thing going on over there. When you look at Bend and you look at transportation trends and how we use our curbs and um, how we get around, what trends do you see in medium-sized cities like Bend that are working to help sell houses and make it livable? Yeah, great, great question. If we had that solved, we'd, we'd all be better off. But um, I think a few things that we're seeing um, changing uh, on the public side, um, and we're seeing in, in communities uh, here in Central Oregon, is we've underinvested in our transportation system for a long time. Um, and you saw this in 2017 in the legislature with the transportation bill passing. People are, are enough is enough and they want to move forward and get out of congestion and move forward. So you're seeing the public trend to doing investments. Some what John talked about with Murphy and Empire, um, there's now becoming an expectation. Uh, and I think the, uh, what I see, I work all over central Oregon, Prineville, up in Terrebonne, is people are saying we got to pay and we got to work forward and it is going to have impacts. Um, so back to a little bit uh, earlier what John was saying, that public involvements are going to be very critical, but also providing a vision. And I think um, the city of Bend's doing a great job uh, with their transportation system plan as laying out that vision and expectation. Some of the times we are reactive uh, and we're like, well, we'll build it as development comes, but we're so far behind, we have to set that vision of what our facility is going to be like. And we may not get there tomorrow, 
but we need to have that vision and go forward. And that vision is, you know, for Highway 97 through Central Oregon. Um, you know, I don't think anybody in here would dispute that it probably needs to be four lanes, border to border. Um, but we haven't set all those stages up to make that happen and set that expectation. Uh, uh, Nick just talked about US 20. Uh, we're talking about all those intersections along there and making big decisions. You know, are they grade separated interchanges or are they um, uh, other, other forms of at grade uh, things, roundabouts or signals? And setting that expectation is gonna be crucial uh, here in Central Oregon. And I think that's where the, the TSP is heading uh, here in Bend, but uh, projects, uh, as you saw in the paper, and Terrebonne and other things, is really understanding what Nick said is, we are gonna double the population. Just a good stat uh, I'll, I'll share from, from the Terrebonne project. Terrebonne right now carries about 16,000 vehicles a day. Um, and as you leave Bend, there's about 40,000 vehicles a day on US 97. In the next 20 years, Terrebonne will increase to 32,000 vehicles a day in Terrebonne. And we got to prepare for that. And just to give you kind of an expectation, that is the level of traffic up at uh, Veterans Way in Redmond today is about 32,000. So we are going to have growth, and that doesn't mean Bend is going to stay at 40,000. It's going to go forward, and we're going to have 50, 60,000 vehicles a day on US 97. So the investments uh, that uh, Oregon Department of Transportation are making and others are going to be critical. And it's really critical for de uh, developers and in the real estate is to have that serious discussion because uh, just like John said is we can have all the land in the world. If we can't get to it and can't make that investment, we're not going to succeed. And I think you're starting to see the public understand that and say, we're willing to do that. And one, one thing that's just coming about in Portland, we'll jump to the west side of the mountains, is there is a bond measure right now in the works for 2020 for a $20 billion transportation in, investment. Put that in context, the one that the legislator passed in 2017 was $5.2 billion. So Portland, and that, the polling on that is about 75% in support at this point and a lot of, long ways to go. But you're seeing that. You've seen that in Bend with some of the Go Bond and other things. It's time to invest because we're going to fall further and further behind, and those that make the investments are going to stay ahead. And um, that would be the message I'd leave with you today. Great. We have time for one more question. I have a member of the audience. Uh, this question is for Nick. It's t uh, pertaining to the new Senate Bill 1051, the Rural ADU mm -hmm. Code. And I'm curious where Deschutes County is with that, and if you guys have any ideas of what it's going to look like. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, Deschutes County has indicated strong support for it. Uh, I testified last week on behalf of the Board of County Commissioners in support of the bill, um, along with many others. We had uh, the, the Oregon uh, Realtors Association, Oregon Home Builders Association, um, and many others. Uh, and the two planning directors were myself and Multnomah County. Um, testifying in support of that bill. Uh, Senator Dembro, who is chairing that committee, expects the bill to move out of his committee in, in the next few weeks, he said. And of the five members, the five senators on the committee, four were very clearly in support of it. Uh, the one, uh, I just couldn't get a read uh, if he was supportive or, or not. Um, in general, it, the way the bill is going to look, it's going to be rural residential zones in Deschutes County. So those of you that are familiar with it, it's RR10 zones and multiple use agricultural 10 zones. Um, two acre minimum is what is currently proposed. Um, and then they, it has to comply with, you can imagine, uh, wastewater treatment, uh, DEQ rules for, for on-site septic systems. The key issue right now it, that they're trying to, that the the group is trying to figure out, and I'm I'm on the work group as well, crafting the bill is how to address fire siting standards. Uh, some folks would like to just prohibit them in high and extreme areas. Well, that's Deschutes County, so we're we're, we're pushing back on that, and so we're trying to to create other uh, other measures. Let's let's uh, let's support defensible space. Let's support that they're only in uh, fire districts, for example. Um, potentially some building design standards, but we'll see where that goes. Um, so I expect movement on that. I think there's a lot of support for it, and then I think something will come out of this session. The other piece of it is that part of the bill will, uh, may direct the land, the land Conservation and Development Commission, LCDC, to, to develop rulemaking. 
holy smokes, who knows how long that could take, though. So we're trying to find a, some, some measures in the bill such that between the time it's, it's in effect and the time that they can kick off rulemaking, we can move forward on something because that's one way to provide additional housing in rural Deschutes County. The two-acre minimum on that, where, where does that come from? Because that, that essentially yeah. eliminates one of the biggest impacts would be like a neighborhood like DRW, which is essentially part of the city where you would have far less transportation impact and far more positive impact with the ability to add all those units. So it seems like the two-acre yeah. would essentially gut the effectiveness of the bill here DRW is kind of an anomaly of a neighborhood. It's RR10 zone, but it's one yeah. acre lots. So I'm curious how that's going to work out and why you would, why they would want to eliminate that. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the Department of Land Conservation and Development, not to be confused with LCDC, that's the commission, the department is, is the department. They and 1,000 Friends of Oregon have said that under state law, anything under two acres is urban in nature. So two acres is kind of the threshold that they don't want to go below. And given the composition of the legislature, super majorities in both, both chambers, 1,000 Friends of Oregon is going to hold quite a bit of sway. And then there are other organizations as well that are also wanting to limit it to two acres. That's, that's kind of the first piece. The second piece that they testified last week at the hearing is that they want to start small. They want to start conservatively they, they, before opening the door to additional lots. I can tell you that myself and other county planning directors would say in a heartbeat, number one, give counties local control to decide what the acreage should be for sure. No question. That's, and that's what the Board of County Commissioner's letter says is, is maximum local control. Because in addition to allowing new units in places like DRW and other places, we could also bring many of those that we know are unpermitted and illegal, and as realtors, you see them, um, into compliance, and that would be a great incentive. Now, with that said, I did provide to the committee, I'm happy to provide it to anybody in here, based on the bill as it's written today, two-acre minimum fire districts in the right zones, how many potential eligible properties might there be in Deschutes County? It's between 7,500 and 8,000. Now, we haven't looked at, do every single one of those properties have the right access and all this kind of stuff? We haven't looked at that level of detail, but but that's still meaningful change, even if 5 to 10% of those were to, to utilize this. Thank you. So, Tia, I think we're wrapping up. Okay. Can um, everybody please thank Tia for moderating thanks, today? Yeah. And thanks to Schwabi. Did you have any last things you wanted to share? We do, we do have the raffle. I don't know if anybody right. could bring me the tickets and we could draw it. And while they're doing that, um, because I have a mic and a captive audience, I have one last question for Mark um, that I wanted him to touch on. One of the reasons we bring people from out of the area is to kind of figure out what not to do as a community and, and what's working in other communities and what isn't. And so um, I know at least one of our local legislatures has talked about the use of Uber or Lyft or even ultimately autonomous vehicles to help solve some of our public transportation problems. Um, in cities like Bend, we don't have the population base for mass transit, but we still have public transportation needs, dire ones. And are you seeing other communities look at, at that sort of thing and those options? Yeah, gr great question to you. Um, yeah, across the U.S., uh, there's a lot of movement uh, from some states that have basically mandated uh, if TNCs, uh, technology network companies such, such as Uber, if they are going to provide service within a uh, state, they have to make it open to the entire state. And uh, the OTC, Oregon Transportation Commission, has toyed with that, but I think that's one thing that we need to, to push forward. Uh, it's a, really a flip of a switch for Uber to open up, say, uh, small communities. And there's always somebody willing to get out and drive. Uh, but it is that last mile, uh, and you look at the cost between some of the... Um, fixed transit and other things, it's another tool in the toolbox uh, that a lot of communities are starting to use. And they're seeing it uh, very successful in uh, rural communities. Uh, there's a company called Liberty, uh, which is a, a lift, but it really focuses on healthcare and uh, linking uh, health providers with uh, rides um, and on demand like that. So I think that's something as um, the TNCs kind of involve here in Central Oregon, they're, they're relatively new uh, in, the, in the grand schemes, is making sure 
we have all that access up and down the US 97 corridor and then also make some incentives. So when John is uh, talking on value of the curve here in the next few years is, well, how can we maybe get that to benefit on the transit side? So there's, there's, some, there's some currency there that can be traded. And one of the things is, uh, and there's some great books on it, is in America, the thing that we give away is free parking. There's a price for that pavement. At a minimum, the city puts eight feet of asphalt down uh, that costs, we need to start monetizing that, and there's creative ways to take that and work with the TNCs to provide that last mile transit type uh, connections. Thank you, that was awesome. <laughs> so thanks you guys all for being here. The winner of the Kindle, um, or Kindle, right? <laughs> but Kindle Fire is Kurt Cal Calamandis, and he's from Next Home, which was one of our, um, which was James, the keynote, so Kurt, um, We'll get a hold of you and send you the Kindle. Great. Thank Again, you. Again, thank our panel and thanks to Tia and Schwabi Williamson and Wyatt for platinum sponsorship today. Gonna let you out a few minutes early. Thank you so much for coming this year. Be safe out there on that ice. Awesome.